maybe? Yes. Uh, it's okay, last time we... What did we do? We went on... A boat. Uh, we went to a restaurant. We kidnapped a dude. We took out his men. And, uh, rode away on a boat. And then we came back here and... Hey, Ace! Wow, that was really quick. Um, and then we came back here and we just exhausted uh, Raptor and the Gaichu's dialogue. I don't know if we've done the same for Isabel and, um, uh, and Duncan and Gobbit, though. So I'm going to go give them a little chat. Man, you are lightning fast there, it's Before uh, stream elements, even. <laughs> Well, I doubt anyone will, but the more the merrier. No, let's just go on another mission, maybe. And we renamed our vessel to the Big Texans. That's where we are. <laughs> That's fine. I'm gonna go get some rest, even though it's optional. For the first time since you got to Hong Kong, you wake up feeling well rested and satisfied. Flexing your limbs feels glorious. It's as though you've spent hours cramped up in a confined space and you can finally stretch your legs. You push yourself up and touch your feet to the ground, but something stops you short. Your mouth. Something is wrong with your mouth. Um, and best get with the hands. You reach your hand up and run a finger over your teeth. It doesn't take long to find the source of the problem, a molar on the upper left side. You apply slight pressure to the tooth and it slides out of your gums with no resistance. It's as if nothing was ever holding it in place to begin with. As the tooth comes free in your hand, an image etches itself in your mind. A great chamber, hazy in form and outline, clouds of red mist that fill the air, perfuming it with salt and copper. Great columns stretching up from the ground to pierce the sky, and above it all the enormous grinding gears of a broken machine. In the distance you can hear a sound, a desperate frantic pounding, something enormous at the door, something, many somethings, all desperate to get in, scrabbling and scratching and scraping but unable to find purchase. The way in is locked. You feel a tremendous sense of accomplishment. You've done it. The others are trapped outside, blind and starving, unable to pass through the door. The chamber and what lies beyond it are yours. A shrill giggling noise fills the air like the laughter of a small child mixed with the shivering screech of countless violins. The sound reverberates down your spine like an electric current. The intoxicating aroma of meat fills your nostrils. You've been starving for a thousand years. Soon it will be time to feed. And just like that, it's over. The image fades, dissipating like vapor. Only the tooth in your hand remains. Wait, so we really just frickin' lost a tooth? Just randomly? Okay. I was thinking that was like a, a false wake up, like we woke up from the dream, but we're still really in a dream. Uh, but no, we we just god dang lost a molar. Uh, so what job do we want to do? We can steal some data and tissue samples, or we can go just mess with the feng shui of that place. Let's go do that, feng shui. How much money do I have? That's a lot of money. I'm gonna go drone buying first. Uh, so... Pretty good as far as drones actually go. Oh, maybe I'll see if they're selling any new armor? You can't just stick it. Maybe with some super glue. Yeah. Or some flex seal. That might keep it in. I am now more intelligent than ever before. Next, uh, we need four more karma and then I can get S-Class drones. 
exciting. I don't think you'd want to use the tape. You'd want to use like the spray flex seal. Tape would probably get in the way of, of eating. Hey, beautiful. Good to see you. Let's set you up, shall we? Uh, yeah, let's look at the drones. Give me your finest drones, sir. Oh, we're already using the best he sells. What are we doing for meds? Um, well, geez, we're pretty well equipped, I think. I could buy a new leg or something. Everybody needs better legs. So yeah, let's go leg shopping. The tape doubles as f no. Food would get like stuck in the tape. I guess you can save it for later more easily. You following the IGN story? A Kensai fighter wing from the Mesmune did a honorary flyby of the executive council meeting today. They're rattling the saber hard. Everybody's being courteous as hell, but nobody's blinking. What the hell are you talking about, buddy? The Imperial Japanese Navy. They've parked the carrier Masamune's battle group in Hong Kong for a visit. They're trying to intimidate the city. But nobody's having it, not even the Japan Corps. Looks like it's being driven by some sort of weird international Japanese... internal Japanese pissing match. The Imperial militarists want to cow Hong Kong and bring it under the umbrella. However, almost every megacorp, including all the Japan Corps, want Hong Kong to remain independent. Tensions are high. Uh, do I have anything to worry about? Is this relevant to me? Yeah, don't go into a bar full of drunk Japanese sailors with a free free San Francisco t-shirt on. <laughs> this whole IJN drama is gonna go on like it always does. The Japanese Navy will eventually realize no one's even paying attention. Then they're gonna steam off in a huff and maybe blow a few smugglers out of the water. Happens all the time. Cool. Cool story, bro. Show me your serves. Go on cyberware. So we can get some brain cyberware. The encephalon. This is range. Well, can we not, uh, can't we get this? Require cyberware affinity. Oh, okay, we can get crappy arm. What arms need, like, all the cool stuff? But not legs. I have something to drink, but thank you, stream elements. An alpha grade leg replacement. Well, that sounds pretty cool. Oh, that's a lot of money. That's like all of our money. Never mind. Legs are expensive. I want to save some of my, uh, new yen. So let's just go to this office tower. Not sure who we should bring. Maybe Ractor? Yeah, travel. We definitely need Gobbit. Um, this spell might be handy. Uh, that's between Ractor and Dunk. Oh, that's tough. Um, yeah, we'll bring him. We're going to uh, a civilian area, I guess, so it'll be good to have someone who can non-lethally take down. 
Confirm. The subway flies over the tracks towards Aberdeen. Monsoon humidity clings to your skin, as if it's followed you from Hioi, or perhaps it's simply sunk this far into the earth, penetrating stone and machine, rousing the acrid smells of Hong Kong's underground in its wake. You've been handed a promising job, geomantic sabotage, with a single objective, disrupt the flow of Wuxing Qi to destabilize the corporation. Your client is especially keen on the idea of Wuxing's famed geomancy being used against it, the ultimate humiliation. While the corporation's office spaces are free game, the main target is Wuxing's treasured lotus statue, which resides within a temple on the topmost floor of the monolithic building. Your client's instructions are clear. The more damage you do, the worse the key, and the better the pay. Well, cool. So we have a stupid mummy thing. Now here, Gobbit, in case you want to summon a mummy. Let's give Gobbit uh, this crappy med kit as well. That looks good. Maybe? Actually, might as well spread these out as well. Yeah, we'll give Isabel both of these. I'm assuming Gawa can't use this yet. Nope. The subterranean access way opens to one of the Wuxing Sky Tower's few employee-only entrances. As the underground access point to Wuxing's restricted levels, oh, as the only access point, security is tight. It's unheard of for unauthorized personnel to reach the upper levels. Naturally, that's where you're headed. Gobbit presses a slip of laminated plastic into your hand. A grainy, black-and-white reproduction of your own face stares back at you. The rest of the card is filled with a barcode. She leans in to whisper into your ear. Kindly want you to have this. Spoofed credentials. Fresh off Maximum Law's card printer. These should get you past the front door. Wouldn't count on them getting us much further, though. I guess that the client said something about other ways to bypass the check-in system inside the building, but he didn't go into specifics. Kindly had some choice words about that, but whatever, we'll find a way past security. Evening, ma'am. Swipe, your swipe yourself in. Sure, let's do it. You, uh, you realize your credentials only allow you access through floor 10, right? Hmm. Of course, I'm here to pick up new credentials. Hmm, right. Go ahead and grab your new creds at the check-in terminal. Have a good night, ma'am. Thank goodness we're so gosh dying charismatic. So, employees only beyond that point. This must be, yep, the check-in terminal. That's where Isabel will... Jack in. Just do a little explore. Okay. Sure. Isabel, get in here. Confirm. Time to hack. Um, let's see. This actually looks like kind of a pain to get past. So if we follow this guy... No, they overlap there. Might might have to go around. What? I'm behind the pillar. Get the hell out of here.
That is not fair at all. But that means it'll be real easy to get over here now. Ooh, what's that? Ready for Simon says. I think we're ready to. Um, switch with W and ends with that. Are there any others like that? No. Well, with 62 seconds to spare. See that one to begin with. Okay, okay lower our system trace. Okay, so this place is such a big amount of system trace that allows us to get because it's going to be a real long slog. Whoa. for a crit. Let's see what's through this other direction. Oh! Okay, this looks like a good place to be. That is no good. ourselves.
Yeah, let's hang out here for a moment. We can't heal until next round, so... Damn it, I have to do this. Please don't kill me. Heal. Well, maybe we shouldn't have gone through, but this is what we need. Four, three, five, three. Six, one, seven, seven. Nine, eight, seven, two, eight. Nine, one, three, eight, six. Four, five, eight, nine, six, six. Oh, uh, that was quick. It's this one, right? Security override will just get us access to certain things on their network. It won't actually let us get through the building more. So that'll have to be something on this side. Okay, let's try to actually get across this without alerting anything. Oh, what a pain in the ass, though. safe right here, please don't. Okay. <sighs> hmm. The timing this will be tough because of how those two cross each other. Since this one starts leaving, this one starts coming. So I'm gonna have to like real quick head over here. Four, six, seven, two. Two, three, nine, eight. Four, eight, eight, five, nine. Six, seven, five, nine, nine. Eight, three, one, eight, nine, five. Was there nothing? We've been everywhere in here now. What? Oh, the system access we must need on the terminal. Okay. 
So we didn't get the credentials we need there, but we can go use the system access here. Use security override. Alter existing credential access. Awesome. Heightened access employee ID. Verify credentials. Ooh, credentials expired. Unlimited access to the building that should get everywhere you need to go. But it's expired. Save. I just want to see what happens if we try and check in with it. Oh, we can't, so okay. Let's talk to this fellow. seem confused, ma'am. Something I can help you with. Just clocking in. Nice. A maintenance employee. Disgusting. An oil blotched dwarf half-heartedly scrubs at her hands above a sink. Her ragged clothing resembles a paint canvas covered in multiple hues of mechanical grime. With a slight turn of the head, she looks toward you. Need something? Um, I think I'm lost. Not an information desk, friend. I do real work. Okay, I don't want to lie to the, the help. Okay, so that is, I guess, just an alternate path to get a maintenance access card. Is there on this side? No. Let's, uh, let's go in this employees only area. Hello, fellow employee. Like, what, could we scam one of these guys out of their IDs? A couple of wage slaves amble about their business inside the corporate locker room. The closest man to you flings a jacket into a locker, then turns toward the showers. He stops short when he catches sight of you, and his weary eyes widen in surprise. Ah, good evening. I'm Charles. I haven't seen your face before. Are you new here? Pulling a spot check. Yeah, I'm a security consultant. Oh, right. I learned about this in training. Please tell me, how can I help? Hmm. So we could get his ID, I guess. And he dropped with a very important security drill. Yeah, but, but possible security risks. Well, not I've noticed. Security is normally airtight. Even the emergency response system's on point. I've been told they have some really high-end fire and blast systems. Doubt you'll find any security risks here. And you're up with a very important security drill. Of course! What do you need me to do? Uh, I want to back out of here. I don't want to... I don't want to do any of these. What? I can't do that. I'll be fired on the spot. Or worse. No, I can't help you. I'm sorry. Very well. Yeah, we have a we have a security clearance. We don't need to get that guy killed. So or fired. Yeah, I'm just gonna do a little swipey swipe of my card. 
Welcome, Miss C. Pang. Have a nice evening. Everything checks out here. Thanks. Alrighty. Uh, so I guess this elevator's the one we go in. Door's already open. But alright. It wasn't already open, it's glass, and I'm dumb. This pristine, hyper-sterilized office glistens as if every surface has been polished. Your client has requested that this area be manipulated as subtly as possible, so as to not draw attention away from the temple. The true defacement will happen there, distracting Wuxing's security. Hopefully they won't discover the disrupted key flow on this floor for weeks. Subtle. Subtle's my middle name. Do we need to get it to 100%? Or because we're trying to be subtle, do we want it, like, less than that? Power junction. I'm not sure we want to do that yet. That seems like it will draw a lot of attention. Point. What exactly did we do to screw up the key there? What is this even? A prototype weapon sits locked in a stand. Its locking mechanisms are seemingly tied to the weapon's operation and safe. Ah, oh, damn it. Wuxing Research Terminal Main Menu. Welcome user, please select from the following options. Uh, floor plan. Amidst the documents, a few nuggets of information stand out. A section dedicated to the Wuxing Building's key details. The geomancy plans and renovations they've made to increase key flow. It appears that the Wuxing's already made hundreds of minuscule and a handful of not so minuscule adjustments to its floor plans and building infrastructure. A recently updated file marks its project to add new water lines for the temple's fountain as complete. The document ends with a large list of future modifications that the company has queued for completion, all ways to improve its positive energy output. You click on the folder and a large repository of files containing Wuxing research projects pop up. One section is labeled with a symbol similar to the markings on the weapon just a few feet from you. A quick scan of the data reveals information on the weapon and lab setup. Yeah, let's look at the specs. Through the specifications file, you learn that the... Hey, Kuma. What is going on? Uh, a disruption of its current and some applied force should remove their strengths entirely. I am, I am having a fantastic morning. Thank you. You too, I hope. Let's get out of here. <laughs> Gotta have morning coffee. Oh, so can we not get in here? Oh, we did. This one isn't customized with a bullet slivering? A bullet slivering chamber. Okay. Um, fake? Who can use this? Uh, let's give it to Gobbit. Yeah, let's give it to Gobbit. What type of coffee? Anything fancy or...? Whoa. These are kind of cool little cubicles. 
I like the paper walls sort of thing that they have going on. Just wiggle all the dividers a little bit. That apparently is pretty good. Okay. What's all these plants? Right outside the bathroom. Just a bunch of plants. This is a waiting room. Oh. Oh no. We've drawn too much attention. you ow you almost killed me what are you attacking are they fighting each other oh crap they are fighting each other isabel heal me please i need help thank you um dunk get over here please I guess we screwed up their key so much that all these bound nature spirits have come out. Okay, let's get some point blank. Not that he's both those action points. Great. Haste, Duncan. I think beanbag shot will help us here. What's this? Shoot grenade. Nah, grenade, bad idea here. Yes, please, just fight amongst yourselves. No. All gone after us, so Come on, let's at least kill this one that's right next to us. Very nice. Wait, was it then? Let me turn already. I didn't get to move my other dudes. Not that I'm complaining. They're just gonna fight each other. There, there should be a water one somewhere over there. Well, this this is not what I was expecting from this. Yeah, it seemed like after I moved this drone, um, unless I'm just dumb and didn't. Uh, maybe maybe we hadn't gone to new turn yet. Maybe I just had one action point left on the main character. I don't know. Either way, as long as they're not coming for me, I'm happy. Um, nine, nine. Can we target leg on them? Does that work? Maybe it did. Try this. Oh. Reload. 
butt big. Oh, come on, we might be able to kill that one this turn. Wait, why doesn't Gobbit have that pistol I gave? Or did I give it to Duncan? Who has that pistol we picked up? I accidentally put it in my stash. Yeah. Okay, it's just fire and water left. I guess let's try and get into a good position. But I don't want to be stacked up too tightly. Okay. Smoldering. Where's the water one? I saw its little aura over here earlier. I'm just not seeing it now. Squelch flames. Okay, we'll have to do that. Oh, the range on that. 40% chance, okay. Not get hit anything like that. Light and dark balance is key to maintain good key. Duncan. Okay, Dunk, get out of here. Oh, yeah, I can throw in a proximity mine over here. Why is it fleeing? There isn't a water one? Or did they actually like kill the water one? Let's go explore. Oh, there is a water dude. Okay. Okay. He doesn't see us, so we're just gonna leave him there. Fancy office. All safe. Why would security etiquette help me crack the code? Sure. I guess I know all the common executive safe codes. Maybe. to stack neatly around, ordered and clear. A number is circled several times on the street. 8484. This, this does not seem like a subtle way to change the key flow here. I'm just gonna smash a window. Like they would notice that immediately when they come to work. Same with all the dividers that we moved. Okay, let's see if there's anything else that we're missing here before we carry forth. I guess we can shut down that generator and see what happens. We'll have to fight the water spirit to do it, though. Sneaky. 
one down here. We'll shoot it in the back. Why does Isabel only have one movement point right now? It's a little bit confusing. Okay, let's see what Duncan can get. Oh, he can get real far. Oh, can we move here without being seen? Okay. time. That's fine. Uh, just move here. It might get an attack on us. What? What a waste of your action, dude. That disrupted some more key. The energy here is still largely in balance. More damage can be done. Unless the key disruption reaches fairly high levels, you won't get paid. Okay, I'm not leaving yet. Okay. Let's uh take another look around. Shut off this generator. I mean, why wouldn't this draw security? That seems stupid. 8484. Overload. Oh, well, that's literally all that we had to do. Okay. The more damage we do, the more we'll get paid. I vote we stay a little longer. Okay. I mean, I don't know if there's anything else we even can do. The key is becoming more and more turned. Let's reach a point where this turning energy has a physical manifestation visible. The disruptions are working! Again, this is not subtle at all. If there's a physical manifestation of how badly we've messed up the key, um, this seems like extremely obvious. Seeing anything else we can mess with. How do we get it to a hundred percent? Except read, yeah, read the manual again. Okay, maybe we should just go upstairs before more stuff uh, spawns or whatever. Do we go behind here? There's nothing behind there. I think that's all we can do. I'm good. I'm good giving up on getting to 100. Hmm. Well, it's good enough that we'll get paid. And up here, we're supposed to cause a big ruckus. Uh, we're missing one. Where's fire? I 
map. Drone time. And take cover. Drop it. Than ever use a grenade launcher. Uh, Duncan will just be out in the open, he'll tank. A drone, I choose you. Yikes, really? No, not really, actually. I barely did it. Okay, so I know where... Oh, that's a nature spirit. We still don't know where the fire one is. Okay. Um... Dragon line. Wait, this one's on a dragon line? It didn't look like it. Sorry, nature. It's not your day. Just poof, poof out of existence. Heck yeah. Thank you, Rat Totem. You are extremely helpful here. Okay then. Just love that Earth Spirit. Not really. I mean, main character is very slightly injured. Nice. Oh, we still hit him even though we missed. Very cool. Let's just try and shoot this guy? He has a lot of armor. See if Duncan can do the killing blow. Good job. 54%. Oh, okay. We've started a forest fire. That's no good. Get to a hundred percent. I 
Oh, there's the fire spirit. It's just chilling up there. Does this just work from any distance? Lol. <laughs> okay, that trivializes uh, fighting spirits a little bit. This particular mission. So is the last 30% going to be entirely from, um, from that big lotus statue? Is there nothing else we can mess with besides that? I need to find more key. Oh, crack water pipe. Um, so does this account for 25%? Come on, there should be something else. No? Well, we 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 done a good enough job. Oh, 85%. It just went up? It's just going up over time, like as the fire spreads, or as the water spreads out? I don't know. 100%. Let's get out of here. Uh, security is probably going to meet us on the way out. Escape the Wuxing Sky Tower. Eliminate Wuxing Geomantic Security. A well-dressed man steps forward, his peers staring smugly in your direction. His clothes are smart and clearly expensive, but lack the typical padding worn by guards and thugs. A quick look at his associates reveals the same style. Mages. On behalf of Wuxing Incorporated, we've been instructed to prevent your further vandalizing of the company's property and assets. However... They never specified how, so I vote we do this the easy way. Leave no survivors. Okay, that's a lot of mages. That's some interesting clothing. Um, okay, so we chill out here. Steel links. Roll out. Nice. Paste our board dump. Oh my god, frickin' Isabel. Not cool. Wow, that's a big area of uh, radius. Oh, uh, you know what? Sure. Oh, we missed. Let's punch her. Bam. Right in the kisser. We'll handcuff her next uh, round. They don't seem very effective. Kind of pathetic mages. Go punch. Oh, darn. It's Duncan, the punching machine. Uh, 
Uh, what is this spirit? Avalanche has a close combat bonus. I can petrify people. Okay. I'm down with that. Well, let's get some heat off of us. Uh, Isabel, what do you do? Reload. <laughs> Her chances to hit anything with this grenade launcher are very slim. Maybe she should try going around and flanking. Headshot. Name it this one. Yeah, sorry, Duncan. We can't take all of these guys out non lethally. Doesn't sound like they were willing to take us out non lethally either, though, so. That's okay. No, don't go there! I was trying to click on the skills menu, not make a move. What a dummy. I uh, still don't have a good aim on anyone. Let's just keep going. Dude. Nice. And stone fist. Oh, he, he uh, dissipated. Hmm. That's a shame. Okay, they're both asleep. It's pretty good for us. We might need to haste Duncan again, though. Okay, give the haste to my boy Duncan. 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 Subdue these men. They're criminals. There's no way we can knock him out again without killing him, I don't think. One more turn before we can... Let's go just outright kill him. No. Okay, next turn, we'll, uh... Handcuff this, this guy. You're mine now. Take that. Okay, maybe we can get away with only killing a single one of these guys. Duncan is OP. Alright, let's punch him again. Oh, I missed! Damn it! That woke him up. Uh, get to punch him. And now subdue. Nice. So we did murder one of them. Uh, but I think it was justified. They were going to leave none of us alive. So. And the rest are. Well, probably going to asph asphyxiate from the smoke. Or burn in the fire. But still, we didn't kill them. That's the important part. 
As you reach for the elevator's control panel, you can feel the electric sensation of the key dancing across your skin. This feeling is noticeable to those not even magically attuned. The disruption here is that strong. Behind you, the trapped and turbulent key swirls inside the iconic Sky Tower atrium. You can actually see the air around the atrium warp and ebb as the key surges and breaks against the obstacles around it, looking for a way to move, to flow, and finding none. The job is done. You have desecrated the Wuxing Lotus, and in doing so, blemished the prideful face of a megacorp. Not bad for a night's work. I think we did the job up to the client's standards, huh? The, ele the elevator arrives at the temple. Time to duck out the back door before security can respond further. The back door? We were told there's only one entrance in, though, when we came in. What sort of back door? Wu Xing won't know what hit them. The embarrassment of their own geomantic science turned against them will sit unfavorably on the tongues of Wu Xing executives, and maybe even get a few people terminated. They'll know it wasn't just the building you battered, you sent a message. Everyone has a weakness that can be exploited. The change in feng shui should keep them spinning for months. The complete disruption of their key and destruction, destruction of their temple will cripple the energy at this branch of the company. And with Wu Xing focusing on restoring their temple, it will be a long time before they discover the full extent of your assault. Nice, let's go get paid. Oh, and we gained eight karma. Your calm like chirps, and you can, and kindly Cheng's rusty voice slides along the speaker. You can hear the sounds of mahjong players laughing in the background. It's Auntie Chung, dear. Chang. Um. You've been gone a while. I wondered when you were coming back. I'm here now, and I have a present for you, little one. She sounds like a big cat sitting triumphant on the carcass of a wildebeest. I have the lead on the location of the plastic-faced man. The man we saw in the surveillance footage meeting Raymond Black at the tea house on the docks. Where is he? Not on the comm. Come see me and we'll talk. Okay. Plus one action point. Uh, so we have enough karma. Let's go get those class S drones. Come on. Um, yes. Confirm. And we can upgrade our team further. Uh, so, Gobbit will get a Plague Barrier. You... Espionage. Sure. The Jolt Alert System. That sounds fun. Shock Baton. Red Samurai. Metal. Augment Stance Metal. Okay, that sounds cool. Mangler. Yeah, this all sounds very good. We need to go buy new drones now. Let's collect our money. And hopefully we have enough to purchase them. Out here on the big Texas. The best boat in Hioi. Okay. Claim payment. A little bird whispered in my ear that Wuxing's fortunes are already failing. Falling. Their stock value dropped by 2% already. The client finds this to be an acceptable indication of your success, and has forwarded payment. I've attached your cut. I didn't actually see how much we got. <laughs> That's fine. Since you could not... What? Oh. 
Okay, so when Strangler Bow said that he had like some urgent for us to do, it was actually urgent. Okay, I didn't realize that it was actually on a timer. Because we've had things before that's like, oh yeah, this is urgent. Um, but then like, we don't actually have to do them right away. I don't know. I didn't realize it was on a timer. So we missed out on Strangler Bow's job. And we disappointed him. Oh, let's uh let's see if we have that gun in our stash. Or if we somehow threw it away. Okay, we do have that gun. The bloody end. Okay. So we can hear Kindly Chang, or just ignore her, I guess, and go do this other job. Which may be what I do. Let's go talk to old reliable Matthew. Look at drones. Ooh. A powerful semi-automatic turret. We don't have enough for both of these. We can buy one or the other. Jeez. A wolfhound or a guardian? What do we want? Oh, and get better armor now, too. Damn it, that's probably worthwhile. I'll pick up two of these. Ouch. Here, we can do this. Or maybe we just get the armor for now. Maybe we just stick with our current drones for a little bit longer. Yeah. Confirm. No more coffee. <laughs> no problem. Yeah, let's spend our karma to get another um, inventory slot. The quickest way for us to do that is this. So with three action points now, that'll let us actually do something instead of being unarmed. Can we equip that little pistol? Or do we need more um, ranged combat ability? I wonder if we sell our current drones, if that would give us enough to buy the new ones. Actually, I have pay data. Claim payment. Okay, that's not much. Post pay data. Should probably go talk to Gaichu and Ractor again as well. So let's see, can we equip this? Requires range combat four, so no. Well darn. Can we have three drones? That would be neat. Wait, where's Duncan? Oh, no one's here. They're all hanging out with Kindly right now. Okay, fine. Even Gaichu? Well, Kostre is still here. That snooper app, well, no one's here. Okay. 
Everyone except for Coast J. Hmm, I'm actually going to be right back. I need to go grab something. What else? So let's go talk to Kindly and maybe get berated by Strangler Bow. I don't know. Kindly Chang is in the midst of emptying two plastic shopping bags when you enter. She places the contents in a pile on her mahjong table. Two liquor bottles without labels, a box of her thin black cigars, an assortment of individually wrapped gourmet chocolates, and a large caliber pistol with electrical tape wrapped around its grip. Ah, uh, good you're here. It seems like forever since we saw each other. Um, welcome back. Yes, my darling, yes. I met with several contacts within my network who referred me to others in neighboring cities. Regardless of how far technology moves forward, tradition demands that some things be handled face to face. I've returned with information that will lead you to the plastic-faced man. The man who killed Raymond Black. Excellent. While you were gone, we uncovered a relationship between Justin and Raymond. Did you? And what was it you uncovered? Um, the man who raised us isn't Raymond Black. He's Edward Sang, the son of Josephine, Josephine Sang. You were raised by Josephine's son. That explains where Edward went when he disappeared years ago. Seattle. Uh, what happened? I don't know. Just that he went missing after Josephine completed rebuilding the walled city. That was in the early 30s. You realize what this means, don't you, my sweet? That inbred little goat whore was cold enough to have her own son executed. Um... Even more reason to find the plastic fist man. Uh, I know 
the identity of the plastic faced man. His name is Lee Tai Lung, and he's an independent contractor, a trusted, deniable asset, who handles all of Josephine Tsang's more delicate operations off the books and away from public eye. The plastic faced man is her shadowy right hand outside the corporation. And I know how to find him, too. I've made contact with an information broker. Shao Ji? Who works out of an abandoned night market in Shek Kip Mei, called the Xing House Court. It's not hard to find. Shao Ji has gained access to the plastic faced man's complete itinerary. Where he'll be, who he'll be with, and what sort of security he'll have, the works. You can use it to perform an extraction, grab him, and find out what he knows. Why does he have a face made out of plastic? It's not just his face. Li Tai Lung's entire skull is synthetic. He's designed himself to be the perfect corporate operative. He has installed a unique piece of headwear, you see. It allocates and compartmentalizes client-related memories, so that they can be erased upon the completion of a job. And as an added security measure, this cortical implant will wipe his memory if it detects he's been captured. Jeez. Uh, yeah, how do we get past that? I know a way. I've heard of something like this before. I met someone in the Matrix who had a... Who had to shirk a similar mime memory wipe implant once. It was a requirement for a big job, and she pulls it off. Keep talking. Her handle's Dreamland, and I know where to find her. All we have to do is convince her to give up the secret of how she did it. Sure. No matter who you choose to help you snatch this guy, I'm gonna be there when you extract information from him about Raymond. You got it, Crab Apple. We should all be here. I know that I want to see this. Very good, my darlings. Now listen to me. After you get what you need from the plastic-faced man, I want you to end him. You understand? I need to send a very clear message that this is what happens when you mess with Kindly Cheng's operations. With Kindly Cheng's people. Josephine takes Nightjar, I take her plastic-faced man. Once you snatch the plastic-faced man, Sang will know something is happening. And events will unfold very quickly after that. You'd best close out any pressing business you have before heading out to Shek Kip Mei to see Xiao Ji. Do you understand? Um, sure. Sure, sure, sure. Yeah. And that's right, my darling. No more side jobs and no more dalliances. Be sure that your affairs are in order before you head to see the information broker. All right. Sweet. Let's go talk to people. Yeah, we'll go see if this lady has found out any information. heavy scent buffets your senses. The scent of pure, unadulterated book. Woody, musky, dusty. The light herbal incense from before seems like an afterthought in the wake of paper smell. Looking around, you see that the shopkeeper has abandoned her earlier feeble attempts at organizing the texts. Several of the towers of books are now reduced to piles on the ground. A piece of paper caught somehow in a ceiling rafter rustles gently above you. Pizza delivery! I'll take it over here. You're not pizza. Sorry about that. You owe me for that one. <sighs> Sorry about the mess. I was up all night reading. Or rather, up every night reading. So what's the latest? The latest. He walks you over to a glass table and starts tossing books off it. As she digs through them, you realize the table's not actually a table but a glass display case full of dried medicinal ingredients. Crafty withdraws a notebook from the pile, its binding unraveling, the pages holding on for dear life. Here we go. This one's loaded. With what? 
I got a couple of big finds. Mom's notes are a mess, so I boiled them down to the most important information. An exorcism and the Yama Kings. Where do you want to start? Tell me about the exorcism. On one of Mom's trips to the Walled City, she decided to check out an archway, an old, crumbling relic that residents believed to be haunted. Mom wasn't sure about the hauntings, but upon entering the area, she immediately felt that it was a place of concentrated key. Yeah, I know someone who mentioned the same thing. I'd believe that. It's a fairly prominent landmark. It seems to me like most people from the Walled City would at least have heard of it, if not seen it. What did she say? Creepy. Yeah, I'd have to agree with you there. At least from what my mother wrote, it was a seriously bad. It was a seriously bad. So what happened next? The key wasn't like your standard run-of-the-mill energy. Even for the walled city, this key was exceptionally dark, and it all seemed to gravitate toward the arch. So she did what any kook of her magic brand would try. A Taoist... Taoist? Tao Taoist? Exorcism. Hmm. I'm sure I'm butchering most of the Chinese words, so... Um... How'd it go? It went to hell. The exorcism failed, and something happened to her. She broke. My mother had entered the city strong, confident, and capable. When she left that day, it's hard to explain. It's as if the experience left her vulnerable to those base horrors within the walled city. She grew paranoid and became frail of mind and body, a mere shadow of her former self. It's as if she'd witnessed something, and it changed her. She became more obsessed than ever, and that's how I remember her now, as that broken woman. I'm not sure how this fits into our investigation, but if that sort of malevolence is coursing through the walled city, it's no wonder the people who live there experience such terrible dreams. So tell me about the Yama Kings. Tell me, how much do you know about the Yama Kings? I've run across stories of them. Personally, I'd only heard about the Yama Kings in fables and myths. Things to scare children to sleep, to inspire awe. As you can guess, intimate knowledge about imaginary beings is largely non-existent. And here, we've found the demons of the walled city. Through my mother's excursions into the slums, she came to learn that its residents had their own unique Yama Kings, different from the traditional ones. The people there are segregated from the rest of Hong Kong. Over time, they came to believe that their home was possessed by local demons. Makes sense, considering the place's penchant for crime and disaster. What were they like? There were three that Mom knew of. Lam V, Hu Mang, and Qian Ya. Each Yama King is associated with the negative energy on which they feed. Lam V feeds from cowards, Fu Mang, Mang from the guilty and Qian Ya, slaves. Unfortunately, my mother's handwriting declined with her sanity. She has a lot of details in here on these local Yama Kings, but I could only make out bits and parts. There's a list, something here about rules? Maybe laws of some sort. The thing that stood out to me is here. It's about the proprietor pr propriety surrounding ownership in deals, exchanges, negotiations, luncheons? No, that last part can't be right. Anyway, it says the Yama Kings, under rules or laws, must adhere to the terms of a deal. And there's something else, but... Nope, sorry, can't read anything past that. You know, it's strange to me that Mom found these mystical beings significant enough to mention in her documents. It makes me wonder if she thought they were real, or connected to the curse that she believed in. It's not the best lead, but I think it's a step in the right direction. Okay, lead's a lead. Do you have anything else for me? Feeling alright? Yeah, you can just take a break. No way. I've dug myself too deep to back out now. And I don't say that as a bad thing. I've made progress. I'm proud of that. The sooner I figure out these dreams, the sooner I can rest. 
trust me the plague. I'll make up for it in spades. Naps. Yeah, face yourself. That's all. You make a good point. I appreciate the advice, but don't worry. It's not a total slog. These journals are just as exciting as they are laborious. Send me a copy. Already a step ahead of you. I just finished digitally transcribing the information. I'll send it your way, uh, as soon as I find my terminal. Appreciate it. Cool. Now we have something more to read. Okay, mother's notes. What do you need? Oh, yeah. One second. Sorry, talking about Sorry. monitors. Hey, the plague. Here are those notes you asked for. But before you dive in, a heads up. They're a complete transcription of that list from my mother's journal, as in, they're the thoughts and ramblings of an insane woman. It's not an easy read. Another dream. This time it was a near figure, a shadow, a wraith, faceless. I heard its voice, though it did not speak, and when I awoke, it was inside my home. Though I had been in the city just moments before, where am I? A weight dropped into me. I felt the words of the wraith in my skin, in the tips of my hair. I saw its mouth in my mind's eye, rows and rows and rows of lies. Morning. My hand was to the paper before I even knew what I was writing. I wrote the words, these words. They cannot lie. I added it to my list. Evening. Was it a king I saw? Was I really there? I was in the city, I'm sure of it. Then how did I end up here? Was I carried back? My list is growing. Soon, with this knowledge, I'll stop the kings. A step forward is a step backward. A step backward is a step forward. Each wraith has a name, a true name, and a false name. Knowing their true name is knowing their weakness. To call them on their lies is to make yourself invincible. They will still try to eat you. They fear the feathers of unborn chicks. What? Coral! Kings must be one or the other. That is, of the negative world or positive. But positive doesn't necessarily make them good, nor negative make them bad. They simply are. Once a deal is brokered, it cannot be unmade. 
kings and the planets are closely connected. When nearest the sun, their power wanes. When farthest, it grows. There's only one wraith. There's only one where at wraith. There may be two wraiths, but there is most certainly only one wraith. What? They must follow the laws of the universe, rules set in motion long ago. Should they concede defeat, all is lost to them. Kings are the rulers of us all. They take from us their lifeblood, and with it parts of our souls. Do not give them what they seek, and you will be their match. They cannot lie. Morning. I made breakfast. It fell on the floor in the shape of my death. Another truth revealed to me. I added it to my list. It's all or nothing. They're all liars. Another dream. It was in white space. I could taste the color as if it were air. This time, no voice. Just rose and 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 rose. A mess, I know. There's not a whole lot of significant material other than what I already picked out. But even that is contradicted within Mom's notes. Everything should be taken with a grain of salt. Meantime, I'll keep looking into it. Good luck on your end. Plague. While I was blazing through my mom's journals, something struck me. We've spent so much time reading about the walled city that we haven't thought to look at it. To paint a picture with the information we've been gathering. So I contacted a friend of mine, Riley, a Decker, and asked her to pull some data for me. Her results were surprising, and for what it's worth, I think we're onto something. Riley dug up records of things like reported sleep disturbances, psychotic breaks, HKPF responses to cult activities, etc. She found that they all form a classic bullseye heat pattern around the walled city. She couldn't find any data from within the walled city itself, but the outside data was still enough to establish the pattern inside the slum. This has got to be more than a coincidence. It's too unnatural to be attributed to anything else. I don't know what it means yet, but I've got my nose to the books. I'll let you know when I find out. One other thing. That last email I sent you, the one with my mother's notes, I went ahead and reread it. That took me back to the source text, and I was able to pull something else from her list. This isn't much, but it seems to be pretty consistent across her ramblings. If I'm reading it right, it's kind of like a set of rules that govern the interactions of the Yama Kings. It's surprisingly bureaucratic, if I'm reading it right. The most interesting tidbit is this. There's something here about the kings being unable to back down in a deal. It's like if they give an inch, they forfeit everything. From what I'm reading, the Yama kings have their own code of laws, but they don't have to follow them unless you know how to call them on it. Like, they break the rules all the time, but if you can't cite chapter and verse on which rule they're breaking, it doesn't matter to them. Approach from a place of wisdom, though, and you can bind them with their own laws. Anyway, this is all really arcane stuff, but I think that there might be something there here. I can't vouch for any of it, obviously, but when you take a step back, it all sounds like crazy talk. But one thing I can tell you for certain, my mother believed it was true. If anything else comes up, you'll be the first to know. Sure. Woo! Walk away. Let's go talk to the boys downstairs. Sorry about the smell. It's long past time to purge the coolant sump. If I had access to the proper equipment, this would not be a problem. I could clean the fluid and reuse it. But alas, halogen treatment chambers are rather hard to come by, even in a place like Yoi. Anyway, my friend, you didn't come here to discuss the ins and outs of shop maintenance, I'm sure. So what does bring you here? Yeah, I was thinking. How does your drone self-repair system work? There were three distinct elements to my approach. When these elements were all working in concert, prototypes that utilized the process displayed remarkable self-repair capabilities. This may be a lengthy explanation. I can skim over it if you please, or I can break it down for you if you're genu genuinely in inter interested. Hey, give me the long version. Very well. The long version of it is. The first element of my process was an outer skin that the drone could be wrapped in, a refinement of older, biomimetic self-healing materials, modeled to emulate the self-repair capabilities of living things. 
Imagine a polymer composite interlaced with microtubules, capillaries if you will. These vessels are capable of delivering bonding agents to the site of a wound as it occurs, just thus healing it. Interesting. The second element involved the underlying structure of the drone's architecture, the server of servos, gears, circuits, etc. Utilizing self-assembling materials and redundant systems, I created a system by which damaged components could be fabricated and replaced by the drone itself without any need for human interference. Alright. Finally, the system had a magical component. I must confess a certain degree of ignorance when it comes to this portion of the project. I understand it. Some of the theory behind it was done, but the specifics are beyond me. Interesting. Yeah, I thought this was fully yours. Oh, it is. I was the one who recognized the need for a magical component, but I feel no shame in admitting I cannot understand the specifics. I have a mind for figures and physics in the natural world. Magic works according to a different set of principles altogether. Truth be told, it makes my head hurt. In layman's terms, a magical element was necessary to render the system self-perpetuating. Obviously, no purely mechanical system can repair itself indefinitely. The synthetic, the synthetic skin becomes more brittle with every wound it heals, and the automated assembly components will eventually run out of materials to work with. As a rule, fighting against entropy is a losing proposition. But with magic, we can rewrite the rules, weaken the grasp of those entropic forces to the point that they are rendered negligible. Think of magic as the lubrication that keeps the gears turning. I wish that it weren't necessary, but I am also a realist, and I must confess that it is required for the system to work. And yeah, that's what we recovered? Yes, that's right. My thanks to you again, my friend. I'm in your eternal debt. Yeah, what do you think a post-human future would mean? Freedom. The ultimate freedom to direct our own progress and to steer ourselves as a people in whatever direction we wish. Consider, my friend, every aspect of Koshche was tailor-made for a purpose, dreamed up, designed, and built by a singular guiding intellect. Now think of the circumstances surrounding your own birth and the building blocks that shaped you into the woman you are today. Your mother and your father exchanged fluids, floppily no doubt, and with all the mindless abandon that such biological imperatives entail. I uh, do not want to think about. Just an example, my friend, just an example. Substitute my parents instead, or any other pairing you choose to imagine if it makes you more comfortable. The important thing is that the forces that shaped you, and me, and the others upstairs, and anyone else you could care to mention, were ultimately mindless ones, blind, manipulative, biological drives that led to a sperm and an egg to collide. Add in a roll of the dice and a dash of Mendelian genetics, and here you are. The natural processes of evolution and sexual selection guide the development of our species through trial and error. Throw a few billion darts at the wall and see what sticks. In the future that I have foresee, this process will be reined in, guided by our own controlling intellects. Co op an antiquated phrase, the myth of intelligent design will become a reality. But we will be our own gods, reshaping ourselves as we see fit. Hmm. While number two here is true, I don't think that we are thinking about uh, the traits are also will inherit when we make those choices. Um, at least not consciously. And what's this have to do with post-humanism? Step back for a moment and imagine a future in which we have fully integrated with machines. Really imagine it. There will be no niche that we cannot fill. We can guide our own evolution, tailor ourselves to whatever environment we see fit. We will no longer be slaves to the selective processes that have dictated our development such time immemorial. Uh, okay. 
whenever we choose to define ourselves in that way. Humanity is an intrinsically human concept. If we decide to rebrand ourselves as a different species, that is our decision to make. I strongly suspect nobody else would care. What about dragons? Perhaps, but for the sake of our continued development, that's a risk I am willing to take. We cannot limit ourselves out of fear of what others might think. Ghost Jay raises itself up on its legs, stretching so that Ractor can caress its chassis. The motion is alarmingly fluid, more like a living thing than a machine. Ractor traces his fingertips over the drone's shell, his eyes focus on an imaginary point on the horizon. We have placed such unnecessary limitations on ourselves, my friend. It fills my heart with sorrow to know what we could be, but are not. I would see those limits stripped away, peeled back and discarded, for the betterment of all. In the future I foresee, we will open our eyes to the possibilities that surround us. Bodies reshaped to thrive in the deep ocean and the depth of space. Bodies inspired by nature or the human imagination or both. Bodies that can be used and shed and used again, inhabited as their wearers see fit. One moment. Can you stop? I'm going on that car. The timely realization of such a future is what drives me forward. It is the cause to which I have devoted my life. Thankfully, it is inevitable. Assuming, of course, we don't destroy ourselves first. There's a hard limit to the Fusion Man machine. Is there? I don't know. You're speaking of the essence limit and the problems associated with essence loss. Okay, so there it is. Yes, of course it will be a problem, but as with all problems, a workaround will present itself. Of this I am certain. You're just taking it on faith. No, my friend, I am not taking it on faith. My beliefs are rooted in my own observations and experiences. For the time being, let us leave the matter at that. Now, what role would Coast Jay play in such a future? A similar one to the role he plays now, I imagine. He was designed for a purpose, after all. That said, I can see the techniques that went into his design and fabrication having much broader ranging applications. Well, you're pretty attached to Coach Jay. Of course, Coach Jay is very close to me. As if on cue, the drone scuttles forward, the hardened tips of its claws screeching across the metal floor of the shop. It comes up short just in front of you, a strange mechanical chitter rising from deep within its chassis. You might accuse me of anthropomorphizing my little companion, assigning human characteristics to him where in fact there are none. Truth be told, there is much more to Koshje than meets the eye. That's a different conversation, one best suited to be held for another time. Why not? Because I have work to do, and I'm sure you can find better uses for your time than listening to me prattle on. And with that, I'm afraid I must ask you to show yourself out. We can continue to talk at a later time. Is it a later time? Rector's shop is curiously silent. silent. As you step down and onto the grated metal floor, the sound of your own footsteps reverberates through the echo chamber of the converted engine room. Welcome back, my friend. Is there something I can do for you? A quiet night. Yes, yes, a quiet night. One best suited for contemplation, planning, and visions of the future. Let's pick up where we left off. If you like, I must confess I've rather enjoyed our talks. It is good to have a sounding board to bounce ideas off of. Agreed. Glad to hear we're on the same page. I must confess, I sometimes forget how to interact with others. I am, by nature, a solitary creature. It is good to have a kindred spirit, someone whom I can understand on the team. Koshche scuttles forward, mechanical pedipalps weaving. His motions are as alien and charged with menace as they have ever been. Ractor glances at the machine and it takes a step back. <laughs> so, my friend, you had questions for me. Go ahead and ask them. 
I'll answer whatever I can. I use that sometimes you forget how to interact with other people. An idiosyncrasy of mine, I suppose. Where I get lost in my own head, relating to others becomes difficult. It's nothing personal, just a quirk I occasionally struggle to hide. Yeah, I feel the same way, dude. Yes, that is the feeling, yes. You summed it up quite nicely. Uh, so what 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 do you mean Koshe is a bit special? Hmm. Tell me, have you noticed anything unusual about Koshe in the time we've worked together? He's more like an animal than a drone. Yes, a good observation. Koshe's behavior could be described as animalistic, and for good reason. And? The drone lowers itself, its killing legs splayed. Ractor looks at the drone, his head cocked, then he returns his gaze to you. His behavior is not drone-like, because he is not a drone, at least not in the way you would understand. He is a prosthesis. Oh, is there like a little, little tiny pet animal inside? That's wonderful. Explain. The principle is very simple. You can think of him as a cyber limb, if you will. We may be separated by distance, but he is joined to me as surely as a replacement leg to its wearer. Oh, okay. He's just always rigged in? Not on a conscious level, no. But subconsciously, yes. There is a constant two-way stream of data flowing between my brain and his systems. When he takes a step, I can feel it as a tingle in my spine. When he tears into flesh, I feel the satisfaction. We are a singular entity in two bodies, metal and flesh made one. Interesting. <laughs> Ghost acts as a home for my primal, animal impulses. The id, to use Freud's structural model of the psyche. The analytical portions of my mind, the ego and superego, live on in me. They govern the id, and by extension, Koshche's behavior. When we're on a run, I rig him to Koshche. I do not command him to attack. Rather, I loosen my grip on his reins and allow him to kill. He wants to hunt, to dominate, to bathe himself in blood. Reproduction would also be a drive if such a thing were possible. Okay. Yeah, so what happens if you are killed? Yeah, <laughs> no, my friend, of course not. Gostra is not capable of storing any part of a human mind. He simply doesn't have the capacity for it. If I were to die, he would fall dormant, the same as any other drone. One day, perhaps, I will perfect him, and a part of me will live on in his chassis after the meat of my body die. But for now, I'm satisfied to live with him as a combined entity man and machine, joined through a form of neural parabiosis into a single being. A beautiful first step into a post-human future. Good to know I have a mad scientist on my team. Who well, else that, my friend? And the feeling is mutual if I must associate with violent criminals. I suppose I am happy to call them friends. Huh, so the drone is a home for your most destructive impulses. It's a proof of concept, primarily. There are other advantages, of course. I shouldn't have to explain the value of a combat drone that wants to kill. How are we going to beat that essence limit? I could do that. I have already shared quite a lot with you, and you haven't run off screaming. A good sign, I should think. But tell me the plague. Are you certain that you want to know? Some secrets are less pleasant than others. You might prefer to leave this stone unturned. I want to know whatever you have to tell me, baby. Very good. There are things you don't know about me, my friend. Important things. Please don't this end with you hitting on me. I wouldn't mind. For one, I am not out to put it whole. What do you mean? He's in Koshche. 
There was an accident when I was young, a shop accident. I barely survived it. I am very heavily cybered, my friend. You wouldn't know it because I keep my enhancements hidden. Others have found them disturbing in the past. Okay. Oh. So is he already, like, past his essence limit, maybe? Maybe he, like, would have cyber psychosis, but Coach J, like, houses that and handles it for him. Some sort of enhancements. Everything below the mid-pelvis is a replacement. That's where I was sheared in half, you see. It's a miracle I survived the experience. Blood loss alone should have killed me. But here I am, alive and well. Greatly improved, in point of fact. Everything below the hips. Yes, a dramatic loss, to be sure. But not so terrible as you might think. By every conceivable measure, I've been improved since the time of the accident. I am more than I was before, not less. That is really hard to imagine. The doctors installed stimulus generators in my brain when they repaired me. With these, I can mimic the full range of sensations that the human body is capable of producing. Imagine the ramifications of such a thing, the things you could do, the things that you could experience. The implications for operant conditioning alone are staggering. And so yes, I have lost the entire lower half of my body. The full ramifications of such a loss are obvious. But in return, I have gained so much more. At will, I can goad my brain into producing whatever sensation I wish. I can poke at the wiring of my own consciousness. I can reroute that wiring as I see fit. Okay. That was really to essence. Look at me, the plague. I have a shred of essence left in me, and only barely that. But I suffer none of the ill effects associated with traumatic essence loss. How? A quirk of psychology, long viewed as an illness, but never properly understood. What I now understand to be an evolutionary adaptation to a post-human future. We will conquer the essence limit, given time. Natural selection will see to it, and I am proof. How do those stimulus generators work? The technology is rather akin to SimSense, but considerably more powerful and flexible. Most SimSex, sim, blah, blah, most SimSense experiences, those found in BTL chips, for example, are structured around basic narratives that provide their users with context. But if you strip away the veneer of ex escapist fantasy, what you have left is an extremely powerful toolkit. I've never heard anything like that. And I'm not surprised. They're Russian technology, government-funded, quite experimental. The project was cancelled shortly after I received my implants. Something about graft and corruption on the administrative level. Yet another example of good science derailed by bad politics. Anyone else has gotten these? I know of a handful of other recipients. From what I've heard, the others were all driven quite mad. The hand control over the inner workings of one's own brain is a tremendous responsibility. Perhaps the others were less well equipped to handle it than I am. Be careful, man. I've carried these implants for over 20 years, my friend. I know how to handle myself. You have nothing to fear. There's a lot to digest. <laughs> yes, my friend, I'm sure it is. Perhaps it would be best if you left. You have some processing to do, I think. And I would like the rest of the evening to myself. There's more to the story, of course, but nothing can, that can't wait until the morning. Yeah, we'll talk tomorrow. Uh, so about that, it's tomorrow, right? Again, the shop is quiet. No hammering of metal, no whine of heavy machinery, nothing but the sound of your own footsteps and the low electrical hum of Rector's work terminal. The monitor above the work desk is, is alive with vibrant imagery, graph, technical readouts, and reference images fill the screen. Ah, uh, hello, my friend. Back for more answers. I can take the time to talk if you can. Sure. 
Essence loss doesn't hurt you. I want to know why. Yes, I did tell you that, and I do owe you an explanation. Tell me, my friend, what do you know about Essence loss and its effects on the metahuman psyche? Oh, thank you, Kuma. Oh, jeez. Essence loss removes your ability to feel anything, sure. Yes, that's right. And this detachment can be deeply traumatic for the sufferer. The literature is full of such cases. Now what would you say if I told you that after my accident and subsequent cyber surgery, I felt no different at all? That even in the beginning, I was completely unchanged. Why? Would you like to know? Yes. I was born with what society has deemed a psychological defect. Out of fear of social repercussions, I spent most of my life hiding it. But I still hide it, even now. The lessons of my childhood were not wasted on me, and I know the value of reputation. But since the accident, I've come to recognize this quirk for what it really is, a selective advantage. I was diagnosed as a primary psychopath at the age of eight. All right. Uh, so yeah, psych psychopathy, that is the next stage of human evolution. Push Jay scuttles forward, brushing up against Ractor's leg, metal on metal, separated by a thin layer of cloth. The drone's many eyes focus on you, irising wide open and bathing you in a dull red glare. Well, diagnosed is probably not the correct word. There's no formal diagnosis of psychopath in the DSM, but all the markers were there. I displayed a complete lack of empathy on the Davis Interper Interpersonal Reactivity Index, and I scored a perfect 40 on the PCLR. A blood test showed that I had inherited a damaged gene and that it has been linked with aggressive behavior, and the activity level in my ventromedial prefrontal cortex is vanishingly low. He's on the psychopathy spectrum. Cool. Where are you on that spectrum? Before I turned to the shadows, I considered myself a pro-social psychopath. This is to say I had the markers for psychopathy, but I had expressed some of the expected behaviors. But I never killed anyone, at least not until it became a job requirement. Now I'm not so sure. I will admit there is a certain thrill to our profession. It's quite liberating being paid to hunt and kill other men. I only indulge these appetites when I'm on the job, and I never bring my work home with me. I'm sure this all comes as a great shock to you, but I tell you, my condition's actually an advantage. One that's protected me from the mental trauma of my accident and subsequent reconstruction. The psychological blow of Essence loss can be devastating. This mental trauma is ultimately responsible for much of the damage and self-destructive behavior suffered by those who ride the razor's edge. Of course, there's a physical limit to how far the metahuman body can be pushed, but a normal person will reach his mental breaking point far in advance of this. The loss of self, the loss of capacity, is too painful to bear. What does it matter to me if my capacity for empathy and conscience is stripped away? I never possessed either of those qualities in the first place. Hmm. Yeah, so... Are we actually friends? <laughs> of course. The words always carried a cerebral meaning. I can understand the concept of friendship, what it means to others. I know how important that feeling is, even if I can't experience it myself. People with my condition, my advantage, are not incapable of bonding with others. The only difference is we do so on a cerebral level rather than an emotional one. I enjoy our association and I recognize the advantage in our being allies. I like talking to you. What better reason for us to be friends? Okay. I'm down. <laughs> okay. 
Okay, cool. I'm not looking to bust his balls about this. Yeah, I guess there could be other factors. Of course, but this explanation seems the most likely, does it not? I'm certain that in time it will be proven right. I hate them kind of being a dick to him now, and it's like I wanted a different dialogue option. There's a lot to process. I'm certain it is. For what's worth, I think you're handling the information rather well. In the past, there were others who were more rigid in their thinking. When I revealed myself to them, they reacted badly. I'm quite pleased you haven't done the same. That's what you do, that counts. Now, woman after my own heart. I wish others were so open-minded. I am not a broken thing to be fixed. I'm exactly what I was meant to be. You don't know how rare it is to find others who accept me as such. Of course. Yeah, that's yeah actually, uh, I dig that. Seems, seems pretty cool. In the darkness of the cabin, Guy Chu is hunched over a pile of keepsakes. He has unpacked most of his box, and the contents are lying strewn about the floor in a disorganized mess. The ghoul gingerly picks through them, turning each one over in his fingers as he feels their shape. He addresses you without looking up. Please mind your step, the plague. I fear I have made a mess, and many of my possessions are quite delicate. I would be rather upset if you were to accidentally crush any under your feet. I apologize for the mess. Uh, yeah, but... Getting homesick? No, I'm remembering my home, and obviously I would like to return to it. Long ago, however, I came to terms with the impossibility of that desire. Today, I'm simply thinking about the chain of events that brought me to Hong Kong. I've been considering our talk about my former unit, about what my plans are with regard to their incessant hunt and need for closure. I began to think that I, too, need closure, an end not only to the hunt, but to our dance around the core issue. One of us must die, that the other might live. As it is, we are locked in stasis. How do you want to accomplish that? That is the question I have bent my mind to, answering since we last spoke. It's not an easy question to answer. My initial thought was to strike at a secure Renraku holding, something valuable enough to draw the attention of the Red Samurai, and ensure that Renraku reported that a ghoul was involved in the mission. It turns out that was not necessary. I began searching the Shadowland BBS for any jobs against Renraku holdings here in Hong Kong. It is surprisingly easy to use the Matrix when you can read postings with your fingers. Slower than direct interface, but certainly possible. I also began to offer a reward for information on a Red Samurai team known to be operating within the city. A modest reward, nothing that would attract too much attention, but enough to keep people interested. This bore fruit. A red samurai team arrived here a short time ago, smaller than normal size. Sweet. It is definitely them. My contact described Ishida and Takagawa perfectly, as well as a new heavy gunner, most likely from another disgraced squad. What's more, he described a woman who looked exactly like Sasaki, but with a scar here on her forehead. Precisely where I cut her. I can't draw them out. Simply put, I intend to lure the team into responding to an action they believe to be perpetrated by an ordinary Shadowrunner and ambush them. 
Then I will kill them, all of them. Once that is done, I can be free. I found a job I am certain will draw a red samurai response. Renraku is moving a prototype drone through Hong Kong on the way to a research facility in Chiba. It is of a new design, implementing machine learning and pseudo-intelligence. Something that advanced would surely attract a Red Samurai team should someone attempt to steal it. Okay. Red Samurai are primarily proactive. The majority remain at the forge until dispatched across the world. Those locations that are not assigned to guard high-value locations, black laboratories, secure research facilities, and major complexes Hong Kong has none of these, as Renraku's facilities of that type are primarily located in Taiwan. My former unit will be the only one close enough to respond to the threat. The Johnson for this run is a Renraku scientist escorting the drone. He wishes to leave Renraku's employ, but is unwilling to risk reprisal should he escape on his own. To put it simply, he wishes to make it look like he was killed during a robbery. Hence why he wishes the experimental drone stolen. If there is no body, there will be no investigation into his whereabouts. Okay, um... Yeah, sounds awesome. As soon as you are ready, I will message Mr. Johnson, let him know that we are prepared to fake his murder, and to be ready for our arrival. I suggest you prepare as well. The Red Samurai are excellent combatants, not to be taken lightly. Awesome, we have another job. That is why I'm talking to everyone, to try and get their side quests. Yeah. Let's make sure we don't have another for actor, actually. Oh, I can see those weird metal feet. Eight, eight toes on each foot. You're kidding, man? Oh, fuck, I wanna, I wanna get everyone side quests because we're at like that point of no return. But it's just like I haven't been talking to everyone as often as I should between quests. There's just so much dialogue to go through right now. Kind of a pain. I wish, I wish I wasn't like at a point of no return. I gotta wrap up all of these side quests. Uh, what's up with the feet, dude? The replacements I was fitted with all those many years ago. They've been modified somewhat between then and now, as you can see. Improved. They're amazing. If only I had the time and the resources, I'd make them for you. No other ways I would improve you, my friend. Perhaps later, after we've finished all this. But for now, we have more pressing concerns. What are you working on? More options for Koshche, as always. He is still far from perfect, but every iteration inches him closer. Yeah, what led to your diagnosis? My mother had me tested. She'd always kept a watchful eye on me. Obsessively so, truth be told. It was a rather poor way to experience childhood. Why? She blew my childhood behaviors out of proportion, I'm afraid. And the woman always had been motivated by fear. She had her reasons, I suppose. What reasons? Malignant narcissism runs in my family. None of the men of my line have understood the concepts of conscience or empathy. And they wouldn't have had much use for them if they had. My grandfather was an abusive drunk who killed his own brother with a gasoline-powered ice auger. My father was a terror to his employees and assistants, a shark in a business suit. I suppose my mother expected me to follow in their footsteps. And I suppose she was right, in a way. My career in the shadows has led to more bloodshed than my grandfather's mania could ever have hoped to. I was driven to it though, driven by theft and betrayal. Left to my own devices, I might never have taken a human life. I'll give you that. Well said, my friend. 
Things happened as they did, and I have no regrets. We're both the better for it, are we not? Surely it is advantageous to have me on the team. Heck yeah. Well, there you have it. Uh, so after your diagnosis, what happened? I learned what was expected of me. The doctor was very helpful in that regard. He offered false hope and placebos and false promise that he could cure me if my family met his price. And to me, he offered an escape. All that I had to do was play along and my problems would be solved. It wasn't difficult to pretend I had been cured. Once I understood the outward signs my mother was looking for, I was able to ape them well enough. In time, my mother came around. Yeah, I'd have done the same. Of course you would have. Anyone would. Not everybody would succeed, of course. At the risk of sounding immodest, my natural talents for acting and mimicry are quite impressive. And I had an incentive to play my role well. My grandfather lived out his final days in Black Dolphin Prison. Do you know the place? Yeah, maybe. It's a storied place. One of the most appalling detainment facilities in Russia. And that's saying quite a lot. I was determined not to follow in the old man's footsteps. I am not an animal to be caged. Raptor bends down and runs his fingers over Kostya's chassis. The drone stands motionless, the lens of its many optical sensors focused on you. In any case, there you have it. I am glossing over many of the details, of course, but I'd rather not discuss my childhood any further. Instead, let us think to the future and the promise it holds. So yeah, in your ideal future, people without empathy, morality, or humanity will replace everyone and all be like half machine. Right? <laughs> yes, people like me. Tell me, my friend, how does that make you feel? What is your gut reaction to the vision that I have shared with you? Hmm. Sure. <laughs> good, very good. I'm pleasantly surprised. The sixth world is no place for compassion. It's a predatory world, a world of monsters. Some of those came with the awakening, and others are of our own design. But they're there. If our species is to thrive, we need to shed those weaknesses that prevent us from asserting our dominance. I speak with the clarity of a man who is not a man, in mind or in body. And the things that others refuse to see are as plain to me as the light of day. I tell you, my friend, life is better this way. One day you'll see for yourself, and you will thank me for what I have shared with you. Okay. Okay, I think we've uh, pretty much exhausted him. I'm done talking with him. So we have a job for Gaichu. Let's see if we can get a job for Isabel or Gobbit. Hey, Dunk, do you have anything to say? Uh, I don't even want to talk to Duncan. I feel bad saying that. Need something? I'm busy. I've already done these dialogue options. She wants to offer me a job. So I've already done this dialogue, but, but I think I picked this first option, not this. What is this? Done. You'll find the pertinent documents waiting in your inbox. If you decide to accept the mission, just check the box in the message documentation and it will ping my comm link automatically. I'm sure the briefing I sent you will satisfy your curiosity. Trust me, the plague. This is a good job with a solid plan behind it. You'll see as soon as you read it. And speaking of which, you should go do that. Awesome. Okay, that was easy. So we have the job for Isabel. Let's get Gobby. Gobby! How are you liking life here on the big Texas? It's fine. Shaping up. Having new roomies is always nice. How are you enjoying your cabin? Comfy enough for you? I'll get used to it. Yeah, you will. It'll happen quick, too. Quicker than you'd think. Trust me, I know. It may not be not be much, but we're safe here. In the shadows, that's everything. 
It'll take the big Texas over the Barons any day. That's the spirit. Uh, what about the stuff in that story you told me? You make it all up. <sighs> Seattle, I'm hurt. It all went down exactly like I said it did. Well, except for a couple of embellishments here and there. But they make it a better story. Artistic license and all that. <sighs> Hate to break it to you, kiddo, but I'm beat. It's been a long day. Lesson's over for now. We'll pick it back up next time. Alrighty. I'll have your next lesson ready and waiting, too. Scurry along. Your mentor needs a rest. Have you rested? I guess so. You know, the big Texas has really been shaping up over the past few days. With all the work we've been putting into her, she's starting to feel like a real home. Anyway, enough about the boat. You ready for your next lesson, or did you just want to chat? Yeah, I'm ready. Yeah? That's good. I was hoping you'd want to keep going with this. It's good for you, and I'm kind of enjoying it too. Gobbit runs a hand through the knotted ropes of her hair, a contemplative look on her face. A moment later, she turns her attention back to you. Sorry, that shipped. Alright, there's going to be another long story, so I'm thinking we should take it in chunks. If you've got any questions, you can ask them along the way. And if you need to take a break, we can come back to it. Sound good? Sounds good. Good. So last time, I told you about the event that brought an end to my illustrious career as a subcontractor. This time I'm going to tell you about the run I went on with my regular team. Was this where you started running with Isabel? No, this was long before Iz hit the streets as a runner. We were friends and everything, but she was still learning to deck back then. She was good for her age, but she wasn't ready for prime time. You don't know anyone from the group I'm talking about. They're all gone now anyway. Sorry. Thanks, but it's alright. When you run in the shadows, losing people's an occupational hazard. As shadow runners, we're disposable assets. It shouldn't come as a surprise when we get used up and tossed away. Yeah, nobody lives forever, man. Yeah, you know how it is. People die and it's sad, but there's no sense moping about it. Sad you meet that group. We're mutual friends. We actually all lived together before we decided to start running as a team. There was this floating squatters commune out in... Oh, Hung Hom Bay. It's probably still out there, actually. I haven't been back in a long time. But I spent a few years living on the thing, and the rest of the team lived there with me. The squatters commune. Yeah, we called it the sinking ship. It was like an enormous raft, all bolted together from old shipping containers. It wasn't the most comfortable place I've ever lived, but the price was right, and the company was good. Alright. Sure. Our muscle was a Hawaiian Jew with poor impulse control. Big round guy with lumberjack arms and ringlets in his hair. He called himself Honu. I guess that he loved turtles? I don't know. Street names are weird. We had a tech specialist, Egret. She was tall, gawky, dyed her hair bone white. She had a drone named Arlo that followed her around like a lost puppy. She was kind of a jack of all trades, but she could get the job done. Fun at parties, too. Our de facto team leader was a guy named Sui. He was a wiry troll, if you can imagine that. Probably about 2% body fat, all skin and bones. Walked with a hunch to make himself look smaller. He was a shaman. Followed rat, like me. Hmm. Interesting. It was, but then everyone I've worked with has been interesting in his own, in his or her own way. As a rule, shadow running is in a profession that attracts boring people. All right. So one day, Sui brought us a job. He'd met a client in a Victoria Harbor bar, a rich Eastern Tiger exec. The guy wants to steal some from a shiny object. I know, I know, it's stupid, right? That was how the Johnson described it to us, the shiny object. That was what he wanted us to get. He never gave it any other name. A rat shaman hired to steal a shiny object. 
<laughs> yeah, you can see how the gig would be hard for us to resist. Anyway, the client told us what to look for. He described it as a chunk of red jade about the size and shape of an ostrich egg with a mirror polished surface and gold wire inlays. He said they'd have paper charms hang off of it, foo talismans, Taoist sorcery stuff. We weren't supposed to touch those. The client also told us about the shiny object's then owner, an old hedge wizard turned entrepreneur named Kong Shuyan. So you're supposed to steal a crystal ball from a wizard, essentially. Hmm, when we boil it down like that, it sounds kind of silly, doesn't it? But hey, that's just the world we live in. Like I said, Shu Yan wasn't just a wizard. He was an entrepreneur, a business wizard. The guy had resources. From what we were told, the old man was keeping the shiny object in one of his warehouses. He had a bunch of them. He'd built them... He built himself a nice little empire, selling magical paraphernalia throughout puppet vendors in the Yao Ma Te market night, night market. Supposedly, a good fifth of the stalls in that place were on Shu Yan's payroll. Okay. So we'd cased the warehouse for a couple of nights before the run. You know, did some recon, took some notes. From what we'd seen, we were pretty sure that Shu Yan was keeping our payday in a vault area at the very back of the building. Security was pretty heavy, though. He was paying a local triad for protection, and he kept a lot of their boys on staff. Tsui was the one who came up with the plan. We'd split up outside and enter the warehouse in two teams. Team A would create a diversion. Team B would hit the vault while security was looking the other way. We'd grab our payday, regroup, and get the hell out of there. Okay. Worked surprisingly well, up to a point. Team A, Honu and Egret, circled around the loading dock, just as we'd planned. Tsui and I waited by the service entrance. We didn't have to wait long. A couple of minutes in, we heard this ungodly crash, then another and another. As it turns out, Egret had rigged into Shu Yan's network of automated forklifts. She had six of them running amok in the loading dock, chasing down workers and crashing themselves to anything marked fragile. That sounds awesome. I know, right? I wish I could have been there to see it. Egret's distraction did what it was supposed to. As Sui and I watched, most of the triad guys at the service entrance abandoned their posts and went ha hauling off toward the loading dock. A couple guys with baseball bats stayed back, but we handled them easily enough. We slipped inside and made a beeline for the back of the warehouse, where the shiny object was supposed to be. I guess something went wrong? No, actually. It was there. Just like we'd thought it'd be. The door was open and everything. The shiny object was sitting there, in a teak cradle gleaming with reflected light. Just like the client had said, it had a ring of Taoist talismans hanging off like a grass skirt. The paper all crinkled with age. We didn't waste any time. I reached in and grabbed the thing. It... Felt strange through my gloves. The jade sort of, uh, pulsed? As if I had a heartbeat. Is an egg. Sounds ominous. Tell me about it. I wanted to drop the thing, but it was our payday, so I slipped it into my satchel instead. I couldn't get the flap closed quickly enough. The package being secure, Sui and I turned to hightail it out of there. Then, things went to shit. Did the shiny object do something? No, not the shiny object. Old Ban Shuyan. He was standing there, right in front of us, larger than life. I'm guessing that when he heard the commotion in the loading dock, he'd come running, well, wobbling, or he'd come running, wobbling, to make sure his treasure was safe. As it turns out, it wasn't, because I'd already stolen the thing. He looked displeased. What do you think we did? We had our backs to a wall. We lit the old bastard up. It was pretty epic, truth be told. Spirits were summoned, spells were discharged, the vault door sealed behind Shu Yan like something out of a movie. At one point, the old man leapt onto Sui's back and tried to bite his ear off. I won't bore you with a play-by-play -play of how the fight went down. And then we crushed him. Unfortunately, the fighting had caused some collateral damage. At some point during our showdown with Shu Yan, the control panel for the vault door must have eaten an arc of lightning or the blast of a power ball. 
It was toast, all black and melted, and neither of us could fix it. Is there a trap there? Yep, that's about the size of it. It was only a matter of time before the old man's remaining security guys found us in there. And there's still one way out, a ventilation duct, up high in the rafters, but it was too small for Sui to fit through. He was a troll, after all. I had the shiny object, but if I left Sui there and security got to him, well, you do the math. So here's the conundrum. We got our payday in my satchel. The team is split. It's inevitable that more of the Triad 49ers are going to find us. But we don't know when or how many. Egret and Honu are holding their own in the loading dock, for now. I can stay with Sui to help fight off the inevitable wave of Triad 49ers, but we'll be badly outmatched, like, badly. The odds of survival won't look good for either of us. If Egret weren't pinned down in the loading dock, she could probably get the vault door open. But in order to get to her, I'll have to leave Tsui alone in the vault. If Shuyan's reinforcements, reinforcements find Tsui before I get back with Egret. Well. Wow. So that's the scenario, Seattle. Not a lot to work with, I know. Now tell me, what should I do? Um, jeez. So going for Egret and trying to get back, I think would be the thing to do. I just hope that Sui can hold out. Because if you just wait there with him, then like, Lord and Egret might not even know that you're trapped there or anything. Like, I don't know. I could try and just use the magical artifact. And between these two options. I would try to use shiny object. That's the most stylish answer, isn't it? Just audacious enough to be fun. It popped into my head right then and there, same as did yours. So that's what I did. No hesitation. I just made it happen. It was almost like Tsui had been waiting for me to pass him the thing. He seemed eager, eager to take it. He hugged that chunk of rock to his chest like a newborn baby. Colors swam in the stone and something changed in his eyes. Then old man Suyan's 49ers breached the door, and Tsui unleashed hell. What went down in that room? Well, I've only seen that kind of carnage a couple times in my life, and I've been running the shadows for years. Those trad men were torn to scraps by the end of it. I don't think I'll ever forget the sounds they made. I, uh, I spent most of the fight huddled up in the corner for my own safety. What Sui let loose from the stone didn't seem terribly interested in discriminating between friend and foe. Yeah, what, I, what exactly did it do? It summoned a hostile spirit? Or did it, like, take him over? Something like that. Truth be told, I don't know what they were. Like, like I said, I was hiding. They couldn't have done it without the shiny object. Not in a million years. Whatever they were, the rock brought them there. We waited for them to calm down in the vault and for things to go slithering away. I think that Sui had some limited control over them, which is why they didn't eat us. After they were gone, he gave me the shiny object back. I put it in my satchel and we bailed. We collected the others on the way out. They were blissfully ignorant of what had happened on the other side of the warehouse. I didn't see a reason to change that. We hightailed it back to the docks and caught the first boat back to the sinking ship. Mission accomplished. From what I'm told, people still avoid Shuyan's warehouse like the plague. It's supposed to be haunted even to this day. People who set foot in that building keep turning up dead. Pretty sure I'm one of the only living people who knows why. Anyway, that's it. Lesson's over. If you got any questions, ask ahead. Yeah, what was the point? There was when I started telling it. I thought I was going to tell you to be comfortable with breaking the rules. I don't think I'm going to say that now, though. I'm not feeling it anymore. Yeah, your team made it out, though. They didn't stay that way for long. But let's leave that for next time, huh? I don't want to get into it just now. Okay. Let's get, let's get back to that lesson. Oh, tell me more about the sinking ship. I moved on to the sinking ship when I was just a kid. 
I think I was 12, maybe 13 years old at the time. In the beginning, it was just me and a couple of rat shaman friends, Cadmus and Melvina. They were older, but they were always cool to me. Um, is it typical for like that many rat shamans to be in one place? Not terribly, no. I mean, we have lodges, same as any other group of shamans. You can usually find a few of us hang out in those. I guess there's just something special about our little group. Or maybe about the sinking ship. We liked it, and we felt at home there. It didn't hurt that the sinking ship was well stocked and provisioned when we found it, either. I don't look at me like that. It was abandoned when we took it. Abandoned? There was a team of Shadowrunners that had lived on the thing before us, but they bit it on a job. Cat and Mal heard the knock of opportunity, and they claimed the raft for Rat in record time. Taking over the sinking ship was an easy job, mind you. The previous owners had installed traps and automated defenses all over the raft. Cat had his hands full with those for a month. What kind of traps? The usual stuff. Explosives, pop turrets, that kind of thing. Cad and his sister Yasmin took care of most of it without too much trouble. The biggest problems were the scuttling charges. The runners who built the raft had installed these explosives all along the perimeter that had ripped the bottom out of the thing if it were ever seized by the police. The explosives were tricky to deal with. Cad was able to disarm them, but he had to leave them where they were. It was always just slightly uncomfortable knowing that I was sleeping on top of a couple hundred pounds of dormant explosives. Can't blame ya. Like I said, it was free. There weren't really even any rules to follow, which suited me fine. Malvina was sort of the leader of our little nest, but we never really listened to her. She was always trying to play the mom card. It's still a sense of responsibility to us. It was cute. She did have a propensity for getting things done, though. I have to give her that. Anyway, after a few months, other people started showing up. Squatters, homeless people, shadow runners, and assorted crazies. As long as they stayed, cooled with, they stayed cool with us, we were cool to them. Eventually it became a community, imagine that. Okay. Is that why you're on a ship still? I don't know, maybe. Never really thought about it before. But yeah, maybe. I guess I'm a water rat now. Okay. Oh. I'm sorry this lesson went up getting a little unfocused at the end. I'm not really sure what came over me. It's cool. Well, I still feel bad about it. So look, I'll make you a deal. Your next lesson will definitely be on point. And I'll tell you what it's about up front. No more question and answer sessions. How's that sound? Alright. How about now? Hey, ya pal. Are you ready for that next lesson? Absolutely. Straight to business. I like that. Good. This one's about people like Auntie Chung and why we need them. There won't be a Q&A session after this story, but I want you to listen up. It's important. Sure. Alright, so here's the upfront lesson. Fixers are important. You can't just go to a Johnson yourself and get a job. I mean, you can, but you shouldn't. It's a bad idea all around. Why? No, Seattle, not for that reason. Auntie Chung and people like her serve a purpose. You get a job from her, and you can trust that she's vetted the client. That's important. It protects the whole team. You, uh, you remember the lesson from last time? The one about Sui and the shiny object? Yeah, how could I forget? Well, after Owen was over, we went back to the sinking ship for some R&R. &R. Sui had told us that the client would be sending a boat to collect the shiny object in the morning. All we had to do was keep the thing safe until the handoff. We were in a celebratory mood. We'd killed an evil wizard and stolen a priceless artifact. A good night's work by anyone's standards. Honu and Egret got good and drunk in record time. So we went back to his cabin with the shiny object to, I don't know, stare at it for a while or something. I retired to my cabin and crashed out. It'd been a long night. I remember waking up to sounds. Yelling, maybe. I was groggy and they were far away. I couldn't quite make them out. The clock said 4.30 a.m., People were always partying on the raft, playing loud music, shooting off fireworks, that kind of thing, so loud noises early in the morning weren't unusual. But something felt off, somehow. It's hard to describe. A queasy feeling in the pit of my stomach, and an elevated heartbeat, rapid, shallow breaths. 
It was a lot like a panic attack, really. Someone is at my door. One sec. Sorry for all the interruptions, just got a package. That's what I see. Yeah, I got the door ace. It's hard to describe. Uh, a queasy feeling in the pit of my stomach, and an elevated heartbeat, rapid, shallow breaths. It was all like a panic attack, really. Not the kind of thing you can sleep through. So I got up to investigate. If something was wrong, I wanted to know. And if it wasn't, I figured I might as well get in on the party. I stepped out into the hallway and my foot slipped. I came down hard, landed on my butt, and found myself sitting in a pool of blood. I hoped it was not Chris's blood. It was pretty bad. So it was pretty obvious by this point. Something had gone horribly wrong. My first thought was that the shiny object might have... I don't know. Unleash something. After I saw it do in that warehouse, I wouldn't have been surprised. I shook that off pretty quick, though. I knew what this was. Our client was playing us. He had hired us to steal the thing, and rather than paying us for the job, he'd sent another team to take it away. So what'd you do? I got up and beelined it for Malvino's cabin. She was the closest thing that the sinking ship had to a leader, and the strongest rat shaman on the raft. Wait, yeah, why not go to Sui? Because I'm not an idiot? Sorry, that wasn't aimed at you, but think about it for a second. There was a retrieval team coming for the shiny object, and they were strong enough to handle Tsui while he was holding it. What chance would I have of stopping them? I figured that it was time to bring out the big guns. Malvina was the one whom I could get them from. I, uh, had some pretty bad stuff on my way down to Malvina's cabin. It was old man Shuyan's vault all over again. The torn up bodies, the blood streaked floors. I saw people who'd been cut apart with machetes, scorch marks on the container walls. Deep down in the pit of my gut, I could feel the thrumming vibration of the shiny object. That heartbeat feeling I had in the warehouse. It was back, and stronger than ever. Whatever that rock was, it was awake. Did you make it to Malvina? Yeah, I burst through the door, all ready to spread the news, and someone smashed a gun into my face. It was Cadmus, my friend. He jammed the muzzle of his super warhawk into my cheek so hard it hurt, and then grabbed me by the belt with his other hand. I wasn't going anywhere. Just over his shoulder, I saw Malvina. She didn't look amused. Yeah, some friends. Well, they were under a lot of stress at the time, and I had just crashed through the door like a charging rhinoceros. Adrenaline and abject terror can make a girl do some stupid things, I'll tell you that. Anyway, it wasn't an attack. There were no hostile invaders on the sinking ship. And our client had nothing to do with what was going on. Turns out there was no client. Stewie had lied to us, to me, because he wanted the shiny object for himself. What he wanted to do was take the sinking ship away from Malvina. And so he used us to steal him something he could use to form foment a mutiny. Okay. As it turns out, betrayal hurts Seattle. Malvina felt it, and I felt it too. Sui had been a friend. I'd just risked my life to save his, like, four hours ago. And he'd tricked me into helping him do something unthinkable. So what do you do? What could I do? I didn't have a whole lot of options, and 
Cadmus was kind of on edge, like red-faced and screaming. So I opened my mouth and I fast-talked my way out of it. I started off by doubling down on my loyalty to Malvina, Cadmus, and the status quo on the stinking ship. Wearing my undying friendship, you know the drill, I did a good job of it, but they still looked a little iffy. Iffy with a warhawk is bad, so I volunteered to prove myself by stealing the shiny object back from Sui. That was brave. I know, right? Not my style at all. But then I didn't really have a choice. I'd inadvertently helped to arm the bastard who was tearing our friends and neighbors apart. I don't think I could have cleared my name without taking his weapon away again. It was a hell of a night. I don't want to get into too many of the gory details. Friends died. Hell, friends killed each other. It was brother against brother. All that jazz. And Sui's indiscriminate use of the shiny object led a lot of things into this world that shouldn't have been. Did you get a good view? Yeah, I wish I hadn't, but I did. I don't really know how to describe the things. They were like animals, but wrong. Too many tails, bones in the wrong places, huge open sores, that kind of thing. There were spirits manifested in physical form. Most of them took the form of rats, forms of insects, rotting things, all of the old pestilence tropes. Sometimes there were colonies of things all tangled together and moving as one. Not the sort of thing I want to see again, ever. So anyway, long story short, I got the shiny object back from Sui. It wasn't easy, but I got it. How? Lies, misdirection, trickery, rat helped. Some of the things that Sui let loose actually came in handy, and he'd summoned so many of them that he couldn't hope to control them all. And that gave me an opening to use them to my advantage. I managed to trick my way past Sui's supporters and the astral menagerie that he'd summoned. It wasn't easy, but I did it. Then I stole the shiny object, and all was right with the world. And yeah, I'm intentionally glossing over the details. I had to do some things I'm not proud of, and people died because of it. But I got the damn thing, and I got it back to Malvina. Long story short, Malvina put the shiny object to better use than Sui ever did. She took to the thing like she'd grown up using it. We still lost dozens of people, but Sui's side lost more. Cadmus was critically wounded, but he pulled through. After the skirmish... Malvina held an assembly. She told everyone there'd be new rules for life on the raft. Anyone who refused to follow them could leave. And if you broke them, you were done. The rules of the sea and all that. After the pronouncement, she turned on the surviving mutineers. Ponu was one of them. He'd been in on Sui's plan the whole time. She didn't kill them, but she did exile them from the sinking ship. People in our economic bracket. As good as a one-way trip to the walled city. I'd be willing to bet they're all dead by now. In the wake of Malvina's ultimatum, five survivors left the sinking ship. And I was one of them. Why? I had to go. We may have washed the blood off the decks, but the energy of the sinking ship had changed. It wasn't the carefree haven that I'd loved anymore. And as sensible as Malvina's rules were, I wasn't up to living under them. We parted on good, but sad terms. And as you'd expect, we drifted apart over the years. It's funny, I hadn't even thought of Malvina or the sinking ship in years. Not until I decided to teach you your previous lesson, and it all came flooding back in. Well, that's the story, it's finished. But I want to circle back on the lesson I gave you up front, because it's important. We need Auntie Cheng to bring us work, that's obvious. But we also need her to keep us honest, to be sure that we on the team are playing straight with one another. Auntie Cheng's reputation rides on the legitimacy of the job she brings us. And that, more than anything, is why we need her. We didn't have Auntie Cheng, or someone like her. We'd eventually tear ourselves apart. It happened on the sinking ship. It could happen again in Hyoi. So anyway, that's the lesson. If you've got follow-up questions, go ahead. What did Malvina do with the shiny object? First she used it to get rid of the things that Sui had let loose. Then she put it away for safekeeping. It's probably still there on the sinking ship, ensconced in some shrine or other, held under lock and key. Okay, at least it's safe. 
<sighs> I'd have preferred if she ditched the thing, but in the end, that wasn't my choice to make. From what I've heard, she's still in power over there, so I guess that it worked out okay. What about Tsui? That walking colostomy bag was already dead, eaten by his own monsters after I took the shiny object away. Turns out, he wasn't much good at controlling them without it. He didn't even live long enough to watch his mutiny fail. Sure. In Seattle, thanks for listening. These lessons are for your benefit, and I think that they help me too. And it's nice to be taken seriously every now and again. Yeah, no problem. I've got Gobbit things to do. <laughs> As you enter Gobbit's cabin, two things grab your attention. The first is Gobbit herself. She looks exhausted, bleary-eyed. The easy smile you've come to associate with her is nowhere to be seen. The second is what she's doing. Gobbit appears to be in the middle of a valiant attempt to stuff a whole roasted duck into a soft saucepan half its size. The bird's rubbery neck flops from side to side with every heave of her shoulders. She looks up from the saucepan, blinking. The corner of her mouth twitches upward, but the half-smile falls away almost immediately. Oh, uh, hey, Seattle. Caught me at a bad time. I was just making dinner. Looks like the duck's winning. Huh? Oh, it isn't winning. It's just being stubborn. I'll make it fit. Don't you worry. <sighs> this would be easier with a bigger pot. I'd have to wash it first, though. And to do that, I'd have to find it. Anyway, you you want something? I'm up to my elbows in Mallard. What about another lesson? <laughs> no lessons today, Seattle. I'm not feeling up to it. What's wrong? I... Uh, it's weird. Ever since our last lesson, I've felt, I don't know, preoccupied with the sinking ship. I don't really do the whole haunted by the demons of my past thing. I mean, that's fine for some people. But I'm allergic to drama. Generally, when the thoughts of the past get me down, I remind myself that it doesn't matter. Laugh it off and go have a snack. But this? I don't know. It's weird. Ever since our last lesson, I've been able to get the sinking ship out of my mind. I guess I'm just worried about Cad and Mal. Which is weird, because why would I be? I mean, I haven't even spoken to them in years. Hell, if anything, they should be worried about me. I'm the one who gets shot at for a living. We should go check it out! No, no, I don't want to do that. At least, not without a good reason. It'd be awkward, and I'm sure it's nothing anyway. Actually, check that. I know what this is. It's my own personal version of the same thing we're all feeling. The psychic sewage that's being dredged up in all of us by whatever's happening in the walled city. I'm sure that you've had some flashes of memory from the barons in your bad dreams, right? Images from your past come back to haunt you? The baron gonna drop everything and go running back there? Because that'd be dumb. So tell me, why would I? It's like 15 minutes from here, dude. Look, I don't want to go back there if I don't have to. Uh, if, if thinking about the place is, is enough to mess with me like this, I don't want to know what being there will do. But I'll tell you what, I'll drop Malvina a line just to check in. Make sure this is a me problem and not a them problem. If there is something going on, I promise you'll be the first to know. Alright. Thanks. Awesome, so was there anything happening? Oh. Okay. Okay, let me go read it. Uh, so the only person that we're going to talk to is Duncan. Let's look at our missions, though, first. Maybe we can do some of these missions first, and then we'll talk to Duncan. Ugh. A recording of Isabel pops onto the screen. She stares into the camera, her eyes full of intensity. You're watching this. You've decided to listen to my job offer. It's a good thing. I wasn't convinced you would. Our target, target is a local Decker, a former Wampoan in the Matrix, who handles Rhombus. He has the software we need. 
Unfortunately, he's unassailable from the Matrix, and nobody knows where he lives in meat space. But I know where he's going to be. There's an event coming up that Rhombus can't afford to miss. He might already be on his way there. As you're reading this message, deckers from all over Asia, white hat and black hat alike, are converging on the Harbor Spires Hotel. This year, Harbor Spires is hosting DETCON, Hong Kong's largest annual decking convention. Rhombus is going to be there, and that gives us an opportunity. We're going to hit the convention, find him in meat space, and get to the software. And we're going to do it quietly. Enclosed, you'll find a copy of the plan that I've worked out for the run, presented in bullet point format. Everything should be fairly straightforward. Okay. I'll provide you and one other runner of your choice with visitor passes to the convention. I will proceed ahead of you using my own guest badge. I will hide in the women's lavatory on the first floor. You will enter via the kitchen and procure me a uniform from the catering staff. Please be sure that the uniform is size 4. We will rendezvous and I will change into the uniform and using it will infiltrate the administrative wing on the sixth floor. You will proceed to the convention hall and await further instructions. Using the admin computer, I will identify Rhombus via his guest registration form. Once I have done this, I will alert you via comlink. I will upgrade your badge to VIP status, granting you access to the VIP wing of the hotel. You will tell Rhombus that he has been granted VIP status and offer to escort him to a complimentary hotel room. You will escort him to a room that I designate and hold him there. I will jack out of the matrix and make my mo yeah, and make my way from the admin wing to your room. We will intimidate Rhombus and beat the tar out of him till he gives us the software. We will tie and gag Rhombus and stuff him into a storage closet. We will not be gentle. It's okay if he starts crying. Actually, please prioritize this. I want to see tears. Software in tow, we will make our escape. See, it's a simple plan, just like I said. We should be able to get through it without firing a shot. So will you do it? Will you help me get the software I need? Sure. Excellent. I knew I could count on you. Saddle up the plague. This is going to be fun. Oof. That's the MV Nalchi. Okay, let's help guide you first. Maybe. Maybe? What is this, uh... Data retrieval job. Tigoth right. Okay, so horrible experiments. So I've gone to a cargo ship. Okay. Let's do this. We'll talk to Duncan some other time. I guess we have to talk to Gobbit again at some point. Oh, let me go talk to Maximum Law and buy the deck. One pony puppet. Is that not? A human figure stands in Law's technology palace, face obscured by a smooth mirrored mask. Probably male, but it's not certain. The figure wears a Wampoan badge on its cheap wearing coat. I am the temporary merchant representative until a permanent replacement is assigned. How may I assist you? Where's Maximum Law? I do not know of a Maximum Law. My job is to not know anything. How may I assist you? Who are you? I'm an indentured servant to Wampoa. I incurred my debts in stolen cyberware. My debts are being paid by my cyberware. My personality is suppressed by a no-soft, so that I may serve Wampoa according to a precise algorithm. Okay. So we could get this. It's pretty cheap as well. Can we get our deck up a little bit higher, maybe? 
How much karma do we have? None. Okay. Well, that's easy. Let's just get the crappiest deck that we can then. Ooh, something to pick up over there. Just leave that laying around. Lying around? Oh. Now I am sort of a decker, but a really crappy one. Okay, so we went to this one from from here. We go to the dock, I guess. Okay, we go down here. Jomo. Come on, Jomo. Win, not lose. Maybe buy yourself that new hat. Alright, let's go. Uh, so let's take Gaichu for this. like a pretty good lineup. If I have to do a little tiny bit of like light decking, I can do that now. The ride out to the Nauchi is nerve-wracking. Captain Jomo seems an expert pilot, but massive waves threaten to scuttle his small boat at every turn. Deep thunder rolls in the distance, and at the edge of your vision, lightning occasionally illuminates your target, the MV Nauchi. As Jomo pulls your small craft directly up to the bow of the Nauchi, where you're least likely to be spotted, he throws a rope ladder up over the side, hustling you aboard before pulling away. Time to get to work. Okay. He's actually pretty good with meds. Um. Gobbit, you're always low on this stuff, so. You need one of these as well. Can you take this mummy? Can you use this yet? No! Uh, here, you can heal our robots. And Gobbit, you can use this. What is this? Why am I not wearing this? Is it because I'm an idiot? 
It is. Okay, looks good. Climbing onto the foredeck of the Nauchi, you pause to catch your breath. The cargo ship rolls and pitches with the waves that batter her sides, and rain assails the deck. Deep thunder rolls overhead. After a tense moment waiting for the inevitable alarm klaxons, you hear nothing but the storm. I hear nothing but the storm, and I smell no adrenaline in the air. I believe we have arrived undetected. Okay, let's keep low, stay behind cover. The storm is making it nearly impossible for me to hear. It will be much worse for the security on the ship. They most likely will not notice us if we stay out of sight. If we are seen, they will be forced to use wired alarms, as the storm will make using their radios next to impossible. We should hit them with all possible speed before they can rouse the rest of the ship. Okay. So, this is a stealth mission. Game saved. Camera controls. <sighs> if only I had someone who's better at ducking. What a joke. Security mage, okay. Security guard there. Oh, oh god, they move. Stealth is not my strong suit. Okay, can't climb up there. I need to sneak past this dude, really. I think we have anywhere we can go there. Whoa. Please don't turn around? Okay. screwed this up. What do we do? Ace. Gaichu. Gaichu. Is that an alarm? Is that guy going to go to the alarm? I think he is. Security captain right here. Okay. 
after his punch. Don't use that. Okay, so... Wait, is there another alarm over here? No, he's just running away. Okay. Okay, got you. Metal stance. Ooh, your text will do AP damage. Gaichu is protecting that one. You, you must protect this one. No one must be able to hit the alarm. It's a weird stance, Gaichu. Shoot this man. I said it thought. not use that. Sir. You're asleep now. Please enjoy your stay. Have a shirt.
Maybe. Is this the only guy left? I think it is. Okay, we are not a very stealthy bunch of people. But that's fine. Probably another group of dudes over here. Can we climb up here and spy? No. Okay, so we need to go that way, but. Hi guys! So there's an alarm. Is that the only alarm in this room? I mean, if I put an acid fog, like, right on top of it. There's no way we're stealthily doing this. Please don't see me. Damn it, I had to try, you know. Ouch. Uh, Gobbit, put down some fog, please. Right there. Gotcha, are you still in metal stance? You are. Oh, oops, I screwed up. Oh, he can't walk there because there's a pile of metal beams there. Well, oops. As boost goes straight. Toxic fog, probably. Yeah, that guy's still up. Oh, thank goodness. Okay, I have to get them out of there. <laughs> Steel links. Captain goes first. to my drones. Yeah, I don't know. Can't go in that poison fog? That's the only guy left. 
guess if they can go all the way around there. No, we... Oh, well. Why can't they pathfind around that stuff? Come on, Gobbit. Can you do it? Oh, yes, 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 yes. Uh, I guess it makes more sense for us to try to shoot him. Nice. Well, a uh, very stealthy mission. As you creep down onto D-Deck, the ship is eerily quiet, and the sound of the withering storm is muted to low moans of wind and shuddering vibrations when lightning strikes. Collecting yourself, you listen carefully for any other signs. Nothing. Your presence on the ship appears to be as yet unnoticed. Nicely done. We're almost to the goods, and the rest of the ship's got no idea we're here. Fighting down here will definitely get their attention, though. Let's play it smart. We get the goods... Radio our pickup and get out. Yep. Keep your eyes open, Seattle. We've gotten this far by being careful. No, we haven't. No reason to change that now. I'd like to get home without any extra lead in my body. Well, they do call me careful. Fire suppression. Uh, here, Reactor, you have this. This is a control panel for the ship's water pumps and fire suppression system. The knobs and switches here can cut off or supply water to anywhere on the ship with an outlet. The readouts indicate the fire suppression system doesn't have any safety locks engaged on it. By adjusting the pressure, you could flood the hallways leading to the stack, slowing down any guards trying to reinforce the area. This would certainly set off a shipwide alarm and draw every available guard to your position, however. Okay, so I'd say if the jig is up and we have been rumbled. What about up here? There's an already open door. The panel's door is hanging open, the wires inside sparking occasionally. It looks like someone was recently in the process of working on the cabling, but was called away. This might provide useful access to ship systems. Uh, rewire the camera feed. Awesome. Whoa, okay, we don't want to go in there. And we kind of do want to go in here to get that med kit, but... but actually, we don't even need it. Oh, drones can go through here, okay. other rooms. Let's save. Just so I can save scum. Okay, that's not too bad. This computer appears to be for monitoring and controlling the ship's systems. Power routing, alarm systems, and bilge pumps. Like everything else on the Nalchi, it's an obsolete piece of junk that doesn't even have a VR interface. It's just a touchscreen and keyboard. <clears throat> if this controls ship systems, maybe we could draw the guards away to a different deck by triggering a false alarm. Let's investigate. 
The power writing system appears to be connected only to some low-level ship funct functions. Sewage control, HVAC, and backup battery control. Doesn't look like there's much you can do with those. This alarm system doesn't seem connected with the actual security alarms. It appears to be primarily a voltage and short app protection system that engages if there's a power overload somewhere on the ship. Okay, a few tweaks, and you could probably fake a voltage overload elsewhere on the ship. That'll probably... Hmm. Okay, we'll keep that in the back of our mind. I'm saving again. about in these rooms on the side? Sure. Right here. You have this. you have like a real ranged option. Wow. Okay, we're like fully stocked. not perfectly safe, but we can get a drone through to this room and then into this room. Would that be helpful? Let's go fake that alarm somewhere and see what happens. But I don't think that we actually need to. I think we can just send a drone to go get the objective. After a few adjustments, you set off a system test alarm on C deck. It won't fool anyone for long, but they'll have to go to C deck to make sure it's not a real alarm. seems dangerous, because they'll all be back here after we come in here and get our stuff. The cold storage tank and attendant machinery are lit from within the organic suit by flickering, baleful lights. The tank containing Omega Sequence 358G chugs quietly with the hum of pumps and coolant. As you look at the tank, the fluid shifts and there's a soft thump as a mass of organic matter drifts up against the glass. A pale, lidless eye stares at you from within the tank. The face it resides in is a ruined mass of tumors and scabrous pustules, a mutated mass of teeth and indeterminate growths dominating what should be the nose and mouth region. As you look, it fixes its lone eye upon you, the pupil flickering back and forth as it tracks your motions. The plague, this thing is alive. I don't think it's intelligent, but it's definitely living, despite being made mostly of cancer and disease. Curious, this creature does not appear to be in pain, despite the rampant disease that runs through it. The aura appears metahuman, but different somehow. I don't care if it's not in pain, Nibbles. 
This thing deserves to be put to rest. Being forced to live like this. Let's keep investigating. Click file one. Initial research into the metagenics presents a singular challenge. To wit, the study of not the study not of genes themselves, but of the interaction between genetics and the unseen world of astral space. If the creation of a particular metatype or magically expressed phenotype was as simple as the recombination of given amino acid sequences, then the creation of mages would be as simple as the expression of a given eye color or skin tone. Unfortunately, such expressions are far more complex. The expression of traits previously considered to be supernatural is a complex interplay between mundane DNA, the condition of the ambient manosphere at the time of development, and the interactions between genes and what we have dubbed astral shadows. Any research into these is fraught with difficulty due to their resistance to traditional, that is to say, technological, instruments. Ergo, Omega Sequence 358G is a project decoupled from the usual safeguards against project overruns. We've been granted extensive magical assistance in our pursuit of a higher metagenic understanding, as well as autonomy from legal concerns. As such, Omega Sequence project materials must be kept in Eastern Tiger secure facilities only. Deviation from this may result in local law enforcement interest and subsequent cleanup costs can be prohibited. Phenotypic alteration is the key process which allows for the Omega Sequence project to progress. Ordinarily, an organism's phenotype is set and cannot be changed after a very early point in development. Morphology, phenology, replication processes, any alteration in the coding sequence of a living organism is invariably fatal, except in the case of the Omega Sequence. A combination of alkylating agents, ambient mana control, and potent alpha emitters allow us to control the replication of the Omega Sequence metagene. This is accomplished through alteration of the interactions between DNA and their astral shadows, the building blocks of metagenics and mana-based abilities. To understand this concept, consider an Indonesian shadow play. The story one watches is not of the puppets, but of the shadows they cast. A skillful puppeteer manipulates not just the puppets, but the face between the screen and the viewer. So too is it with metagenics. Magical aptitude, metagenic traits, and formerly unknown parazoology are revealed when mana levels reach a sufficient point to allow the astral shadows of DNA to engage in their delicate, powerful dance of replication. To change the metagenics of an organism, we do not manipulate only the subject's DNA, but the space between that DNA and the astral plane. We cast the requisite shadows, engendering change that cannot be explained solely by base pairs, alleles, and nucleotides. Control is our challenge. Control is a delicate art. It requires patience and perseverance, as well as scientific acumen. But with a fine enough degree of control, we will be able to replicate magical abilities, trait expression, and black swan effects. What are these black swan traits? Individuals born during events which cause ambient mana to spike have been known to express extreme magical potential, and meta traits not possessed by the majority of their meta type. Research into Homo sapiens nobilis subjects born during the awakening, for instance, indicate that ordinary elven longevity simply does not apply, that there is no upper bound to their telemetric regeneration. Effectively, they appear to be immortal. The goal of the Omega Sequence Project is to harness and unlock these black swan metatraits, beginning with the question of the longevity factor in Homo sapiens nobilis. Treatments for extending human lifespans already exist, of course. Organ transplantation can extend life by up to 50 years and leonization treatment can theoretically extend life for several hundred, yet the drawbacks of these are apparent to any who scratch the surface. Leonization is prohibitively expensive and erodes the patient's essence with every treatment, leading to eventual systemic collapse. Organ transplants can preserve the body, but plaques build up in the patient's neural tissue, and the patients must take a cornucopia of immunosuppressants for the duration of their life. True longevity lies in preventing aging from occurring at all. Omega Sequence 358G 
represents our most advanced metagenic prototype yet. Preliminary results indicate that the test clone's age will lock at 19 years, and progress no further. In order to test this, we have induced artificial aging of the clone through a fast-grow organ replacement process. Unfortunately, this has led to an explosive cancer and mutation rate, rendering it non-viable for any other types of metagenic research. Even so, the value of this test subject cannot be overstated. Oh boy. After a few moments of whirring, a small draw drawer opens to present you with a rack of vials. Each one contains a scrap of tissue. You power down the machinery, the lights in the vat dim, and the creature slowly closes its single eye. As the last hum of power fades, the creature drifts away from the glass. With the data and tissue sample secured, you are ready to make your exit from the Nauchi. Pulling you, pulling you your comlink, you dial Captain Jomo. Jomo is listening. You ready for a pickup, my friend? We're standing by and have eyes on the ship. And yeah, make it fast. Easy, la. We'll be there in a few minutes. Be ready right where we dropped you off, friend. This is Tygath. Is the task done? Okay. A complication? Okay. Yeah, I can help with that. <sighs> okay. Yeah, we have to help him out. If we want to get paid, we have to. Oh my god, get off of my freaking phone line. Good evening, the plague. My name is Huang Jaemin. I represent the Blue Heaven Soul Paw Ring. I've just become aware that you are in possession of data and tissue samples from Project Omega Sequence 358G. I would like those samples. I'm willing to pay you for them. Who are you? How do you get this number? Quite frankly, your employer doesn't know the first thing about Matrix security. We've hacked his comlink and his rental car. I simply dialed you once you called him. My apologies for such an unorthodox introduction. A woman of your stature should be afforded more respect, but time is short. Understand you are an associate of Kindly Chen's. My own organization is far too trivial to have attracted her notice, but I believe you can help me change that. Merely doing business with you will increase our, our standing a great deal, and since I have information that may save your life, Perhaps we can come to an arrangement. What do you mean, save my life? The Blue Heaven Ring has been retained by Eastern Tiger in order to prevent the theft of the Omega Sequence data and samples, the very things you've just taken. Your employer, whose full name is Tygath Wright, has been attempting to acquire them for some time. The entire reason the data and samples are being shipped to Seoul is because of a botched shadow run, one on the Eastern Tiger facility in Tacoma where this project was being developed. Tagath Wright was the Johnson for that run. Your employer is not who he says he is, nor are his motives pure. He was never employed by Eastern Tiger and has no family in Seoul. As near as I've been able to determine, he's an agent of the T- Oh. An elven spy. Trying to keep the secrets of longevity away. So why does he want the data? I'm not certain, but I suspect that the Council of Princes has an interest in suppressing research into elven longevity. Every scientist working on the question of potential elven immortality has been disgraced or disappeared, except for those employed by Eastern Tiger. I suspect that the elves have secrets they'd rather not have the rest of the world know. Wright's attempted to intercept Eastern Tiger's cargo at every port it's landed at. The strike in Tacoma was only the first. There was a second attempt in Perth and the third near the Riau Islands, against the very ship you're on now. Don't think for a moment that Wright will hesitate to kill you as soon as you hand the data over. He didn't seem very threatening, I will say that. Um... <sighs> Just 
Jeez, this is real tough. Um, what? Do we believe that guy was an elven spy or something? Um, we could say no to these guys and just deal with right on our own. Or, I don't know. Ace, if you're there, what do you think we should do? Should we believe this guy or believe um, the Johnson? Yeah, the guy that hired us for the job. That's what they're called, Johnsons. You take a run from a Johnson. Tygathrite is his name. That's just what they're called. To back their identity, you don't always know who they are. In this case, we know this guy's name is Tygath, right? But we don't always know um, their real names or anything. Basically, assuming that what this guy is saying is right, we've been hired by a weird elf dude to stop this research, which is horrible immortal research, um, into elven longevity. And we would be giving him the samples. Or we could side with these guys who are doing the horrible immortal research, uh, but haven't lied to us. Um, like the other guy lied to us. I guess it's not this guy who's doing the horrible immoral research, it's his employers that are, but it's not much of a difference. True. They're growing like weird cancer babies. I don't know, that's why I was asking you. What do you think? Oh, okay. If Red Double crosses me, I'll kill him myself. No deal. I hoped we'd be able to come to an agreement. But if you refuse to see reason, bullets may prove a more effective argument. No one crosses the blue heaven ring and lives. Your death will be an object lesson in that. Well, I think you've made a new friend, the plague. I think he's unwittingly just gotten in far over his head. Our rep speaks for itself. Get out of here. Please tell me these guards have not all come back. Wait, we have to go that way? What's, what's this way? Okay. Shortcut? I'm good with that. Oh, okay, it's this ladder. That's what that was for.
The boat ride back to Hong Kong is tense. Even Captain Jomo's jovial nature does little to lighten the mood. The deep storm, storm swirls in the sky behind you, and although you've accomplished your mission, you wonder what's in store once you reach Ho Chung Village. Who will be waiting for you in Ho Chung? Who will betray whom? And most importantly, how can you survive the night and still get paid? You're certain these mysteries will be revealed, but how you'll learn the answers could be deadly. Yeah, as long as I'm getting paid, that's what's important. I need to buy expensive drones. The Ho Chung MTR station is a testament to high class design left to rot over a period of 15 years. Smelling of stale urine and mold, this stop has seen better days. With any luck, You'll be able to wrap up the job and leave Ho Chung before the sun's fully up. You realize, of course, that Huang is going to be lying in wait for us, yes? That he will try to kill us and steal the data before our, or during the handoff. Of course you do, it is plain as day. We should warn Taiga. I'm not certain he can be trusted. Huang's story had at least as much truth to it as what kindly told us about Taiga. I suspect the facts of this affair lie somewhere in the middle. We should be cautious with him. We should take it slow in Ho-Chung. Look around, get a sense of the place. Otherwise, may we may walk blindly into the hornet's nest. Yeah, I wouldn't want that. Stall vendor. Hello, what do you vend, sir? The street vendor is hawking obviously cheap junk he probably bought in bulk from an outlet. Charms, trinkets, and small toys litter the stall. He waves his arms excitedly, drawing you over. Hey, friend, friend, come look at my wares. Many fine souvenirs for you. I've seen anyone suspicious. What, other than you? Maybe I have, maybe I haven't. What can you do for me, huh? Here's the money. Yes, good, good. Thank you very much, my friend. There were some mercenaries moving through here earlier. Big guns, nasty expressions. I think they were from outside Hong Kong. I didn't understand the words they were saying. I didn't see how many there were. Less than ten, but enough to be a crowd. Anyone starts shooting? Keep it away from my stall, eh? I don't want any trouble. Alrighty. Let's just peep around a bit. Whoa, what? I'm in the darkness. Who are you? An arms dealer? Oh. An access point. Is that where we're meeting? Meet with Tygath. Meet with Tygath is all the way up there. Okay. Hey. Let's talk to the arms dealer. You look like the kind of person who might be interested in some hardware. You got a need? I can give you a solution. You game? Yeah, sure. Show me what you got, baby. Nothing I want. Those are all arms. How about some info? 250 new yen, I'll tell you everything I know. I'm a personal friend of friend of Kindly Chang's. You help me out? I a good word, word for you. Alright, you've got yourself a deal. I saw some tsunami mercenaries arming up further down the canal. Drove right by them as they were strapping on armor and checking their guns. They didn't look particularly happy to be there, but I don't blame them. This is Combat Inc.'s backyard. They wouldn't be welcome here. You got business with them? Keep it away from my van. 
Tsunami is a name I'm very familiar with, a Japanese private military firm, very large and very capable. If they're in the streets of Ho-Chung, someone has paid very good money for them. I don't know what they're doing in Ho-Chung, and I don't really care as long as I don't get shot at. Looked like a protection deal, though. I didn't catch how many of them there were, but it was less than ten. They were well-geared, but they don't look like they had anything heavier than rifles or a grenade launcher. Okay, that's the same information, basically. Jack in, baby. Um, we need medic. Decrypt, killjoy, sniffer. That's all we got. So. I have to do this with my very poor decking skills. Crap, 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 crap. Nope. Look, freaking move. You're so slow. Oh my god, you're way slower than our other Decker. Decker Kane. Um. Wow. We suck. I wish I had a real Decker. No. Fudge. That's not good. I'm sorry, I can't just uh, jack out with all of this here. Yeah. Okay, turns out not good at decking. to keep in mind that I'm injured. Hmm. Water and sparking wires. That doesn't sound like a good combo. Okay. What are these next to this tree? Little pretty butterfly things. What about you, big lady? Okay, I guess let's go talk to Taiga. Taiga fidgets nervously as you approach him. His entire body is tense and his eyes flick rapidly around the market, as if searching for unseen threats. As he notices you, he relaxes somewhat, but only a small amount. Oh, thank God you're here. I'm at my wit's end. I could swear that I'm being watched everywhere I go. I don't like being out here, it's too exposed. Listen, did you bring the stuff? The faster I can get that stuff and leave Hong Kong, the safer I'll be. You stink of fear, little man. Calm yourself. If a threat arrives, we will deal with it for you. Okay, okay, I'm calm. Can we just get this over with? Your comlink's been hacked. 
Shit, what? That must have been how the soul plasma has been staying on me the whole time. It's not my problem. Payment is. Right, obviously. We'll hand over the data and samples and you can get paid. Then we'll all go home safely. Not just yet. None of this makes logical sense, you realize. What about your family? Publishing the data. Your concerns have changed to a remarkable degree. What do you mean by that? It means we know you're from here, Tangier, you son of a... that. And we know you've been trying to get this stuff since Tacoma. What? A bunch of crazy psychopaths spin a story about me and you're gonna believe them. Yeah, you're lying. I see. Well, now that the cat's out of the bag, I need to figure out what to do about this snarl. No sudden moves. I'm feeling awfully nervous. You move too quickly, accidents can happen. Don't be melodramatic. I'd rather avoid bloodshed if it can be helped. If you're amenable, the deal can proceed as planned. Yeah, I'm professional. I'm here to get paid, dude. Well, good. I'd hate to think you'd suddenly develop sour grapes over a little white lie. What do you intend to do about the seal paws? Yeah, what are you going to do about me? Let's take him out. You think I'm just going to let let you hand off, hand this off without a fight? Not happening. I'll tell you what, I'm still going to let you walk out of here alive. I'll pay for the data and let you live. Not the elf, though. He dies. I'm not interested in your pitch, dude. I'm Huang Jae Min. I command the Blue Heaven Ring. I'm not black. I'm not about to let some two-bit shadow runner scorn me like you did. I'll make you one final offer. You give me the data and samples. Help me kill this elf. In exchange, I'll you walk out of here alive. I'll move in and secure the area. Move in and secure the area. We got this covered, bro. You don't need them. Yeah, I'm finishing the job, man. Sucks to be these guys, though. Okay, they have multiple breakers. Okay, that's that's not that bad actually. Oh my god, why are they all the way over there? Why didn't they follow me? Well, that's okay, I guess that we're flanking them now. Holy crap. Uh, come on, little buddy. Back in water stands. Oh. 
Well, we're gonna take out your leader real quick. They have a lot of riggers. Oh. Oh, okay. We could have used this to, I guess, electrocute them? Yeah, I guess we won't be doing that. Wait, what just happened? Did we get, like, all of our action points back without them actually taking any actions? Sure, I'll take it. Let's have our friendos back here come to the rescue. Wait, are you both riggers? Oh no, it's a sniper and a rigger. Gobbit, can you still haste him from over there? <sighs> okay. Got you on fire, my dude. Not cool. Get your buddies out of here. We don't need them. We're wiping the floor with these these guys without your help. You can't run from spider bot. make it harder for Gaichu, but... Yeah, I made it really hard, actually. Oops. I should have done this earlier.
Are they purposely trying to get as much collateral damage as possible? I guess that's sad. Enemies are even left still. Oh wait, is that guy an enemy? I didn't even see that guy. Okay. Sorry sir, I did not mean to forget your presence. Good riddance, one awful little man. Shall we finish this then? You give me the goods. I will wire you your fee when I'm safely away. A pleasure, the plague. I'll be certain to recommend you to anyone who asks after reliable freelancers. Good evening. Cool. Now we just gotta get out of here. And I think I am done for today. I'm gonna go back to, uh, I'm gonna eat some for lunch. I have a special lunch in mind. Uh, and I'm currently working on modding my Skyrim VR setup, so that's going to occupy most of the rest of my day. job is done. Right or wrong, you gave Tygath Wright the data he was looking for and got paid for it. Although admittedly, it was a pittance compared to what you were promised. A job's a job, though. Hioi and further work awaits. Wait, we didn't even get what we were promised? Oh, I would I would have killed him on the spot then. We kept our side of the bargain. I didn't realize he was cheaping out on us. Oh well. Okay, let's save. And get out of here. <sighs> yeah, thanks for chilling with me. I will be playing, um, more How about that disco elysium on Tuesday. Later, peace out.